This presentation is made possible by these amazing individuals and organizations. Whether it was through Patreon, Super Chats, Super Stickers, or by watching, liking, and commenting, I really appreciate each and every one of you. Welcome to the show. <laughs> I'm Retro Nerd Girl, broadcasting live from the International Science Fiction Space Station. And today we are going to be remembering Canon Films. And this is a part two of a series um, that I'm doing. We're going to cover 1969 to 1986. And we're not going to do the full year of 1986 because that was a huge year for the company, um, but we are going to just touch on um, uh, a few of the greats, a few of them, and then we'll we'll uh, convene later for more um, on part three. Um, let's see. I am really excited for this. We are going to have a guest again today, uh, Lance from the uh, Creative Outcast 
uh, is, is going to be here today, but uh, he's not here just quite yet. Uh, before that, I just wanted to say um, that I am just uh, super happy uh, that you guys are here. Just wanted to also remind everybody um, in the chat that uh, there are maybe some young people uh, that are going to be watching this program. Uh, so uh, just so that way they are aware or they get the exposure to um, other films and know that they exist. Um, I do want to keep things very PG around here, even though we will be talking about some things that may be a little bit risque. We can talk around that uh, <laughs> stuff and also uh, some of the brutality that may be in the film. We can talk around all that uh, stuff if we could, because I do want um, I want younger people to be able to um, enjoy um, or, or know about some of this stuff. Um, it, it will eventually, um, they'll eventually learn about this um, as they get older, but I want them to um, at least be able to know that they exist, things like this. Um, a little film history for them, at least. So let's start off with some of the comments that you have in here. I see some, <laughs> some good ones. Brogu comes in with the first comment and says, uh, these are the video chronicles of the amazing retro nerd girl uh, on the International Science Fiction Space Station to boldly orbit the Earth and bless us with her wisdom and beauty. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Well, thank you. That is really uh, outrageously kind and uh, generous and sweet and all, all the things, all the things. Um, guys, also, I will um, on occasion be sipping on a little um, uh, drink that I have here. It's my, um, I guess you call it like a liquid meal, uh, a vegan uh, meal. It actually tastes like ice cream today. I've made like put together really quite an interesting concoction. It tastes really good. <laughs> So, um, yay, meal, meal replacement. <laughs> uh, Keith E is also here. How are you, Keith E? So great to see you. Uh, it says, uh, so, a hippie, uh, so a hippo riding a unicycle goes into a bar. The bartender says, I know why you're here. And the hippo says, uh, you do? He says, yes, you're looking for the unicorn on the bicycle. Ah. <laughs> And let's see. Um, I'm just. I'm, I am going to skip through some of the private conversations amongst yourselves. Um, but we will get a response here. We got from Unicorn Ram from Studio. Dear Diary, my friend uh, is a hippo. We both love bicycles. We both love snacks. But he lives with somebody else, and my hippo friend is invisible. <laughs> and says, a "Happy start." of the end of the week. What, isn't it a great um, way to, to, you know, start off the, the weekend uh, with smiles and happiness. I love it. <laughs> and says also, I'm listening in everyone, but I'm a little bit on my bicycle and a bit uh, dealing with animals and clients. Oh, okay. Um, we'll keep it down so you can work in peace. <laughs> so you won't get in trouble. <laughs> so salute, my friends. Um, and um, of course, this is me telling you guys that we're, um, let me just make sure you think, oh yeah, you guys hear me. I was just making sure that you guys heard, heard me. I was just, it just dawned on me just now. Uh, this is me telling you guys that, that things are looking good. Um and just a little update on Hooper. Unicorn Hooper is out in the lobby selling chocolate, covered um, frozen bananas and sushi. Ooh, yum. Uh, he thinks it's great. It's a great combination. I didn't have the heart to tell him otherwise. Uh. <laughs> and um, Keithy also says, uh, we don't need no stinking writers or actors. We do a live chat. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, you guys are so sweet. Um, and um, I'm just going to uh, head down a little bit. Make sure that we say hello to Hungry Jerk. He uh, says, how are you all doing? Uh, it's so good to see you in the chat. Um, says, um, hi, everyone. And um, Iron, the Iron Spider Kid. 
to 2099 uh, is here. Great to see you. Thank you for being here, says Terminator. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know what that does to me, right? <laughs> Oh, man. Okay, well, I'll try to keep it together and stay on track. We're talking about Canon Films. <laughs> and Raphael Lopez is here. Hello, says, hi, retro nerd girl. And, um, yes, Raphael says, keep it clean. Yes, keep it clean. <laughs> What's more, my mom might be watching, so definitely on our P's and Q's. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> So unicorn says that's so funny you guys uh, be as loud as you want but just keep it clean yes and um botanical brothers is here how are you botanical brother says greetings all looking good rng ak anime girl eyes queen <laughs> that's so sweet <laughs> <laughs> um and uh straw dogs 78 is here and says this world needs a modern version of the canon group you just you know i think there are some out there i think we just don't hear about them because they just don't get the love that they deserve um i know that a24 is a very interesting group of um creators that are are doing some cool stuff they just don't have the money behind them for people to like know about their stuff and and that's kind of some of the things that i want to kind of get into as well some more um uh you know uh independent films and especially like if there are any like independent action or independent um uh science fiction films those are the ones i'm really looking at and there's quite a few that i know of but i mean they're really really independent um and um i we just i think we just well almost finished with the chat let's see a botanical brother says superman versus dr manhattan who ran oh well that's a discussion we've got there's one thing i also want to tell you guys if we can keep things on subject that would be really great um uh because it is um it seems to be the source of a lot of uh controversy when we we stray off <laughs> the, the subject matter um but uh definitely dr manhattan just saying <laughs> i'll answer it real quick uh, you know go to rampant studio says i was listening to some folks talk about Dolph Lundgren not having a stunt double in masters of the universe um yeah it's quite possible i mean he's um the unfortunately there wasn't a lot of um money for <laughs> in the uh in, in the budget for that movie uh they they originally had a lot of money um and then suddenly they didn't have any money at all so it was uh, a nightmare but the film i think looks good for from what it is um so i'm gonna start the process um and uh, botanical brother says gotcha thanks rng yes oh yes to help and um, thank you for understanding <laughs> just like anytime we've strayed it's that's when you know all you know weird things start happening and i i want to at least if we're gonna have a conversation um it, if it's if it's on the topic we're doing i think that would make sense um so here we go we'll start off with the um with this I, I i don't know if there's any let me just check to see if lance is coming or if he's um he's running late or something uh because hmm i'm not sure i didn't want to start without him because i didn't know which um since we're going through the movies we're going to go through all of the movies right so um yeah oh i hope he's okay yeah he said um two hours ago all right so well um i think we better start then um so last uh time we uh, uh for part one we did go through canon films how it started and we went through a general uh, overview of 
of, of the film group and the type of films that they do. Now, I really wanted to um, say this one thing about Canon Films. Um, I don't approve of the way they did business um, uh, for the most part of the way they treated people sometimes um, and and the, the abuse that went on uh, with the, the film the films that they made and how they made them sometimes. But I do also want to uh, let everybody know that I have an incredible amount of respect for their place in history, in film history. I noticed that there was a lot of snobbery about Canon films. Oh, they make crappy films. Uh, all the films are, are not good. I don't think that's true. And a lot of the films that they made really made a big impression on people. And even if they made one movie that was Oscar nominated, I think that that's already um, established that in establishing them as a company that actually made an impact in film cinema. So I just wanted to put that out there. First of all, this is not going to be, oh, look at how bad this film is. Look at how terrible it is. Um, this is more of an appreciation of how these guys were able to put this all together and, um, and, and the entertainment that it brought a lot of people, probably at a time for a lot of people when they were looking for something exciting to do for the weekend, or they wanted to, um, be entertained, wanted some escapism and these guys delivered. Uh, <laughs> whichever way, you know, they didn't always deliver in the best way, but they did, did deliver. And um, that that's one thing that I admire about the company and also admire about the films that they made. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to um, get started. Let me just uh, see what was the last one, because um, I see a few more um, comments. Um, Oh, uh, Straw Dog 78 says, just need to throw it out there. Joseph Z Zito, um, who directed um, Invasion USA Mission in uh, Action, maybe the most underrated director of all time. It's, yeah, it's, it's totally possible. And here's another thing that a lot of people don't understand. A lot of these films actually had more depth to them <laughs> but unfortunately, they were cut down uh, by um, uh, Menachem uh, Golem. So uh, that 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 he had a certain way that he thought pacing should go, and sometimes that would change the movie. And so many of these movies, um, they they were <laughs> actually uh, had explanations, had story plots uh, that were much deeper. And they were um, they they were uh, exchanged for like more action or just you know things that were out of context or things that Menachem thought that was more exciting. And the fact that it, it, I think it throughout his entire career of filmmaking, it was really a struggle and maybe a mission too to try to figure out the American audience. They just didn't have the um, quite the right um they were trying to figure it out they were they were like really struggling to figure it out and so yes those those movies definitely um did you know i thought that they had some merit to them and the action is definitely filmed in a way that's really um enjoyable exciting fun and uh keith e says tensions were going to go on a tangent uh, <laughs> and uh keith e says okay uh, was putting his friend Matt on the train today, but I didn't know what time it is. So I, um, I would just start. Yeah, I know he, he was doing that. And then he said that he had a dinner date and then he's uh, doing something else. So I don't, I don't know. Um, he said that he was going to be available. So we'll just, we'll just wait. It's, I mean, I'm not going to, I'll start without him, but Whenever he gets here, he gets here. Um, Rafael Lopez says, one of my favorite canon films is Life Force. Oh, my God. Please. Yes, me. Yes, <laughs> me. <laughs> mine, mine, too. It's, it's, it's one of my favorite films. I love it. Um, you guys, um, I'm not sure if any of you guys uh, have seen my review for that. Uh, I can 
uh, quickly grab it and put it in the chat. But it is definitely one of my very fam uh, favorite films, uh, sci-fi films. And uh, let me see if I can. Uh... Oh, find it for you. Really quickly. Uh, here, copy the link address for you. And um, yeah, one of my favorite life course view. It's one of my favorites. One of my favorites. And we'll talk about it just a little bit during this. Uh, uh, live stream. Keith E says, uh, is welcome, welcoming Raphael and Spider. Yes, thank you so much. And uh, Keith E says, uh, the outcast has maybe um, some of us don't um, include me. Has a life. Oh, <laughs> oh, he, so he has a life. Uh, yes, of course, we all have lives, and uh, <laughs> we're all alive. And Brogu says, um, there's some new. Um, there were some people snobbish about canon films, but their movies were extremely entertaining to their audiences. Even today, Hollywood can be snobbish, snobbish, but some independent films are great. Yes, I, you know, and I do appreciate um, independent films for what they are, especially if it has a story, uh, you know, and, and, and that was... Also, something I would I take a little bit into consideration again for canon films because they were um, tr all like I said always struggling to understand American audiences and never quite got the hang of it totally. But uh, they, they tried very hard. They did, um, and and they they didn't tr they they didn't give up for the time that they were in the fight of it. Um, all right, so we're at the end here. And so what I'm going to do is I'm um, going to start. Um, yes, yeah, so we, we went through the beginning stages of the canon, uh, talked about the canon group, uh, that it started in 1967. Um, and all of this I read you, to you guys. And so now what I want to do is um, uh, go through the movies. Uh, <laughs> and so this is um, really listing up a lot of the movies that were done before the um, the cousins actually um, started, um, uh, you know, owned this uh, the the company. Um, so uh, let's see if I I went back and told you guys who owned the company uh, originally. Uh, it was uh, Dennis Friedland and Chris uh, Chris Dewey. Yeah, and so they had um, a sense for a lot of European films that were very risque, um, and uh, they um, were very exploitative, of course. And um, they they did make uh, a small turnover, and and was able to keep the the company afloat for a little bit. And then by the eighties, um, they got. Um, they got, let's see, here's one. This is one of the um, uh, movies that Menachem Golem uh, directed. So um, just to give you a, a little background, in Israel, uh, Menachem is, was uh, really in awe of the uh, cinematic uh, process and did a lot of, made a lot of films himself. So he's definitely, uh, he was definitely a filmmaker, um, had a, like I said, he had a different sense of things that were, was more suited to his, uh, upbringing, but, um, he did love cinema quite a bit. And so he did have, uh, quite a few movies. One was, uh, Eagle's Attack at Dawn. Um, it says, uh, here, Dennis Freeland and Chris Dewey produced, uh, risque English language version, versions of 
Swedish films, Inga, uh, 1968, AK, um, I can't say that. And, and um, to Ingrid, my love, Lisa, uh, 1968 as well. Um, at that time, they were involved with the cousins by the 1970, uh, by 1970 with the movie Eagles Attack at Dawn. Menahem Golan was the movie, um, uh, um, and maker and the dream and dreamer, the idea man. Um, and Go Globus was the money guy. So um, they they split up the um, the duties between them. Um, and so the big winner for um, for the company was Joe. Um, and uh this was uh a very uh <laughs> did anybody here see joe um it, it was critically acclaimed let's see joe is a 1970 uh, american drama film written by norman wexler and directed by uh john g avilson uh it stars peter boyle dennis patrick and susan sarandon in her film debut. I mean, this is really one of the wildest films and the character uh, of Joe is, is a crude character, but it was uh, a, a part that was uh, highly regarded, uh, highly uh, critically acclaimed. Um, the budget was only $106,000 and it grossed over 19 million dollars that's a huge uh profit and this is the formula for a small um movie uh studio this is like the excellent formula for a small studio uh studio you make a small film that's you know that's that doesn't cost very much maybe a million or less or the, uh, on the lower side of the millions, and then the profit becomes, oh, you're you're going to recoup that um, with nineteen million dollars. That's a lot of money, um, and uh, it was nominated. It was also nominated for best original sc uh, screenplay at the forty third Academy Awards, and that is impressive. So that. Um, is the like the super early days uh before um the um the <laughs> the uh cousins got into uh uh to business uh with the com um that actually owned the company and so here are a few other titles that they had in the 70s uh, a few more and uh a lot of these are just very um again risque films uh very provocative and uh very some of them were very um violent as well or uh, brutal if you will um and so uh they they had a, a style a style that they established and it's really kind of kept going on they 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 kind of kept a little flavor of um their beginnings even once the uh, the cousins got control of the the film uh, the uh, studio, and so uh, this film, the Yum Yum Girls, I <laughs> I kind of want to see this showcase the budding careers of Judy Landers and Tanya Roberts. Uh, that's got to be um, exciting. I I have to see this. Uh, Straw Dog seventy eight says, "Oh, I didn't know Blood on Satan's Claws was canon." Uh, yet the early days, um, yeah, another one that I was surprised was on here was um, was uh, Blood Feast, which is like another one of those uh, wild exploitation films uh, that just goes for for the you know it's just off the off the chain, off the chain. Uh, so more um, uh, incredible movies. Now the one popular one here is. Uh, I believe, uh, well, there's a couple of popular ones here, um, but Lemon Popsicle was one that was um, originally uh, a, a film that was released in is uh, Israel, but um, it was remade uh, quite a few times in, di in different ways. So the first time was... Um, uh, 
uh, just a translation, you know, voiceover and uh, dub. And then the other time, I think they completely changed the title to something else. But it was a teen comedy drama uh, co-written and directed by Boaz Davidson. Um, and it has a, a cult following. Uh, yeah. So. Let's see. Again. All right, and so in the, in 1979 is when the the cousins uh, got um, the um, the company, um, and they <laughs> and they bought it for only five uh, five hundred thousand dollars. Isn't that incredible? Uh, and so uh, now begins the reign of the cousins, and so. Um, in the beginning, it looks like they really were trying a, a lot of different uh, things, just kind of throwing, you know, anything, you know, just just doing anything. But uh, the one of highlight that I wanted to talk about was the apple. And the apple is really a wild film that you just have to see and, and, and judge for your own uh, exactly how what you think of it. Um, I thought it was um, creative. I thought it was uh, <laughs> interesting. Uh, it does have the sensibility of its age um, of the of the nineteen eighties, but I also feel as it, it tried. It was it was very ambitious. It was very ambitious, and so uh, the Apple, also called Star Rock, is a science fiction musical using biblical motifs. It was written and directed by Menahem Golan uh, and stars Catherine Mary Stewart. And if you guys don't know, she uh, was in quite a few movies like uh, The Last Starfighter and um, uh, the, the Night of the Comet. And um, she, I, I, like I said, probably in, in another video, she, I was actually surprised she could sing so well. I had no idea she could sing and dance, and she does quite a lot of it in this movie. Um, and uh, her name in the movie is BB, and and she's in a futuristic 1994 um, <laughs> and uh, Tel Aviv, and signs to an evil record label. Um, now, when it came out, uh, it, well, Menachem had uh, really high hopes for this movie. He thought it was going to be like the next Tommy or like the next big thing in America. And it just didn't, um, it just didn't do that because it was too weird and too strange and unusual. Uh, and possibly I would say even too long for what it is. The film uh, was panned by critics and considered to be one of the worst films ever made. So that's um, the apple. I really hope that you guys get to see it at least once because it is a true treat if you love um, independent films and you like to see um, just like uh, interesting new ways of storytelling. It's it's not pristine. It's messy, but again, it is uh, enjoyable. This is uh, a few uh, visuals from the uh, the movie, and uh, it, it's just out there. It's it's uh, they tried to do again. They tried to do something um, uh, interesting and progressive, and uh, really spared no expense on on how far they would go. It looks like it. They spent quite a bit of money on this, but. Uh, Unfortunately, it just uh, didn't translate well, if you will. Uh, <laughs> I mean, that picture right there looks really good, but uh, yeah. So now we're beginning to get into the um, the meat and potatoes of the start of their uh, their rule, if you will, um, when we have movies like Into the Ninja, uh, which is. Uh, besides, like, 
movies from Hong Kong and you may get a ninja film or something. This one was really like the first to bring the, to, you know, uh, the term ninja and just the idea of ninjas into the United States and the lexicon really of movie, um, the movie genre, if you will. Like it just became something after them, they really set the stage there. Um, nunchucks is one of the things that they introduced to the idea of the ninja um, because it really was never uh, connected before. That was something that Menachem said, hey, let's you know throw in some nunchucks in there. <laughs> and there we have it, history is made forever. Uh, ninjas are associated with nunchucks. Uh, very interesting. Uh, story here. Uh, it says um, here, um, Into the Ninja, Golan uh, directed, wrote, and produced it, starring Italian actor Franco Nero, um, who does speak um, English, but in a very thick accent. He was in a lot of movies um, and is a, a very familiar face uh, to American audiences because he was in a, a lot of uh, westerns and things like that really did not um, have <laughs> a ninja training at all. So they were able to pass off some ninja training in the movie. Uh, Susan George uh, show Kazuki was in this and um, um, and Christopher George um, and basically what it is a martial artist who uh, his friend in the uh, visits his friend in the Philippines, and he learns that his friend is being harassed by a local wealthy businessman wanting to buy the land um, that his friend is on for oil. And um, Incher um, uh, did very poorly at the box office, but the film became a cult classic and introduced ninjas to pop culture. So that that's uh, <laughs> quite. Quite the film that a lot of uh, uh, people really, really remember fondly as kids. There, that, there's a couple of them, but um, that that's one of them. Um, uh, Brogu says, uh, that's a big apple she's got. Yes, wasn't that a huge apple? <laughs> that was huge. And Bonzo Kilborn is here. Says hello, L uh, R N G. We meet again. I want to make some uh, '80s action movies. Oh, really? Cool. That's that's pretty cool. Yeah, <laughs> that would be great. Uh, Straw Dog seventy eight says Alien Contamination nineteen eighty one was traumatizing to me as a kid. It was actually on the video nasties list. I think. Oh, really? Cool. I'm, I'm gonna have to catch that. <laughs> and Darth Plato says is here and says, "Hey, ga gang, how are you, Darth Plato? Good to see you." <laughs> and uh, yeah, all right. And so that's one we I wanted to cover. Then um, the biggest one of note is Death Wish Two, which is um, was in uh, uh, released in 1982. What happened was that they bought the rights to the 1974 film Death Wish, and then they produced uh, this film starring the 61-year-old 5'9 actor Charles Bronson as architect Paul Kersey turned vigilante. And that was so interesting. Like, you get this guy uh, just beating up and killing people. <laughs> It's just really kind of funny when you think about it, but it was really incredible. Um, they 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 really raked in the dough with that one because and it hit it hit a nerve because people really loved to see this um, fantasy on uh, on the big screen, and I think it was universal it didn't matter who you were you just wanted uh, seeing charles bronson take out all of these uh crazy maniacal um you know bad guys was always always uh a good time and um uh we have 
uh, Lady Chatterley's Lover um, is a 1981 uh, erotic romantic drama film directed uh, by uh, Just Jakin, very loosely based on D.H. Lawrence's 1928 novel of the same name. The film stars Sylvia Crystal and Nicholas Clay. It failed at the box office, and for many, many reasons, <laughs> I will get into some of them. Uh, however, the film became more popular in home video market, as well as uh, constant late-night showings on premium cable channels, such as Cinemax uh, and Showtime in the mid to late 80s. Yes, it, it was on nonstop. Uh, <laughs> and uh, it was one of those things that if you were a kid at, back then, you you were like, oh my goodness, <laughs> what is this? <laughs> it was definitely shocking to see this film at, um, at, at that time. But um, one of the things that really was um, tough, Sylvia Crystal is very famous for the Emmanuel movies, um, which was um, very, very provocative. And um, the thing about it was uh, she was going through a tough time. Uh, she was on um, different drugs and alcohol. And uh, her acting at that time was also affected by uh, a lot of this as well. Uh, they went off the rails and probably put too many uh, instances where uh, there were love scenes, that you would say. Uh, and that really uh, made the film a certain kind of film. And so it took, you know, people, you know, didn't take it seriously. So that was um, a shame. And also <laughs> somebody in the, uh, in the documentary said that they... Um, Nobody actually read the the book, <laughs> so it was loosely based on the um, on the book. Uh, and uh, Raphael uh, says Canon wanted the Apple to be their Rocky Horror Picture Show. It didn't work out that w way, sadly. Yes, it was supposed to be a cultural phenomenon, and it 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 was so like. <laughs> It was so weird. Like, uh, if you, when you watch that film, like, you have to touch, you have to pinch yourself. Like, am I really watching this? It's so unique. Um, and not always in a bad way. It's just, it just hits in a strange way. Uh, uh, and so I, you just have to, <laughs> to look at it in a certain, like, just like step back from it and say, is this really what's on screen right now? Um, yeah. Uh, and El Necron is here. Hello, El Necron. Uh, says uh, that was unlabeled VH. Uh, that was unlabeled VHS back when I was a kid. Oh, the Lady Chalice lover. <laughs> I'm sure. Yeah, because you're. You know, it, it, that's the. They would have the unlabeled um, things uh, for certain ones. Uh, for certain things, <laughs> I'm trying to talk around it, but yeah, there would be uh, black, uh, black unlabeled VHS tapes at, at the video store uh, because they didn't want everybody to see the uh, the covers. Um, and so I'm just going to go through a few more. Um, and Zacharot's here. Uh, Zacharot315 says, Howdy, Retro Nerd Girl and Chat. Uh, how are you doing? How's everything going? And uh, Lance Chapin is here, says, Hail Chat. Great to see you guys. Thanks for stopping by. And um, so uh, we've got um, the next grouping here. Um, a lot of these I didn't get to see, but I did see, and I forgot to um, highlight, um, Hercules is uh, the one, one of the ones that I saw. A Revenge of the Ninja and Wicked Lady. Now, Hercules is a 1983 movie uh, written, directed by Luigi Cosi and starring Lou Ferrigno uh, of the Hulk uh, TV series. And so at the time, I know that uh, he really took his part as being the Hulk 
very seriously and didn't want his image to be tied to a very salacious film. So he really wanted the film to be for kids. And that's what he was sold. They, that's why he was uh, signed on was, was because he, he wanted a film for kids. Um, <laughs> and so um, there was an original script that was written uh, that was just immediately re taken out because there was going to be some risque uh, items in there. And so uh, we have this interesting film with a lot of uh, unique features in it. Uh, it's a lot of fun, but it's, it's also not their uh, formula at all. So I think a lot of people weren't expecting this from Canon Film. They weren't expecting a movie that didn't have any kind of um, salacious material. Uh, it was in no exploitation. What's going on? <laughs> So um, it, it was kind of a shock to a lot of people. And I think that it didn't really um, get a lot of play in the at the box office. They just made even. Uh, and so the film was based on a Greek, of course, mythology and follows the exploits of Hercules. Luperigno reprised his role in the 1985 sequel, Adventures of Hercules. And also Sybil Dannon is in this movie, who is amazing. I love that lady so much. Um, and she talks about in great detail um, what, you know, a couple of things that happened behind the scenes, especially with the script. She said that it could have used a little bit more um exploitation just just a little bit more uh or something interesting to um to keep the story going um but uh, again it was off formula and a lot of people did not um they were like where <laughs> where's the formula uh this is a canon film isn't it <laughs> and oh look the hidden is here so sorry for being late oh you're you're fine we're um uh just uh, getting into it and um, you can always catch the beginning of it later on but yeah we're, we're right in the uh, we're not quite uh, to the end of it we've got quite a bit left to go and so uh, we also have moonbeam 87 here how are you since I was just watching Alistair Sim as Scrooge oh wow uh, Christmas in July huh uh love that version of the uh, uh of that movie and also uh there is uh, an animated version as well with him um and it's just as good too um but let's get back on topic so yeah i did um say earlier today we are gonna try as hard as we can to stay on topic um Let's see. Now we've got Revenge of the Ninja 1983, directed by Sam Furstenberg and starring martial artist Sho Kashugi. Uh, and he's he's just really amazing. They really lucked out when they got him to start working with, uh, with them because um, he brought some legitimacy to all of this. Uh, you know what I mean? And so um, a Japanese gallery owner denies uh, his violent ninja heritage until American drug traffickers kidnap his young son. And the budget was um, just uh, 70, uh, 7, 000, uh, sorry, $700,000 and got $14 million at the box office. Guys, you like you see how when when it works, it works like. That's amazing. That's that is profit, um, and uh, just looking at this really is is showing me like this is what a lot of these movie studios even today need to be looking at. Like maybe they shouldn't be spending a hundred million dollars on a film because you know what do you profit? What do you profit at that point? And this this one movie right here is a very interesting movie to me. Um, I remember seeing it and loving it because I've never seen some of the wild things that I saw in this movie. And 
I just absolutely loved the the female character here. Uh, she does. She's not a good guy. She's 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 a bad guy. Uh, the movie is is centered around the antagonist, and so <laughs> it's really interesting. Um, so, The Wicked Lady, 1983, a British American period drama directed by Michael Winner. Michael Winner really made quite a few interesting movies. Uh, I, I, I kind of like his style a little bit, but I heard that he was uh, very tough on his uh, on his actors and act. It, it, it was uh, uh, very tough on them. And uh, this was starring Faye Dunaway, who is incredible in this movie. She's just uh, really doing the most for this character. Just the looks, the um, her her cadence, just everything about what she's doing on screen is just incredible. Uh, Alan Bates is really great in this. John Gilgood, uh, Denham uh, Elliott, and Hugh Miles is in this. You know who's also in this? Let me see if I've got any. Marina Start uh, Sturtis is in this, and this is um, Deanna Troy from. Uh, TNG, Star Trek, uh, The Next Generation. She plays one of the characters uh, in the film. And the, one of the famous scenes of, of this film is of a young lady being um, a, having a fight with um, the wicked lady. And uh, at some point during the, the, the fight, uh, the wicked lady gets a whip and she like whips her 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 outfit um and it 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 kind of falls off of her kind of and they still go at it fighting each other and it was it was just one of the wildest scenes ever um and so this is a remake of the 1945 film of the same name uh, which i was very surprised to um to hear about when i was doing my research so i'm gonna actually try to track this down and watch it because i'm really curious as to not only the changes uh but uh i, I did i did find this character very fascinating um and so um yeah the uh the wicked lady i hope to review it one uh time sometime in the future for you guys a really interesting movie for uh, for sure definitely had me thinking uh like wow i've never seen a female character like this i've never seen uh the focus of the film also being centered around the bad guy like except for maybe um Scarface, that was the only other one that I know of. Um, and Brogu says, uh, I was thinking the same thing, RNG. Stop spending so much on these films to justify what uh, that money you'll, you'll have to get a billion dollars at the box office. Yeah, it's crazy to me. Yeah, you, you they're, they're shooting for too high with too big of a cost. And this is the same problem that, uh, that, um, Canon Films eventually uh, got in trouble with making too many films that were too expensive, and eventually that that's what took them down. Um, and that that strive striving to make that big win. Uh, and the thing is that you you know you make films, you're probably not gonna make uh, every film isn't gonna be a hit, but if you can make 10 films and one of those films out of the, the bunch becomes a hit, that's, that pays for everything. So, um, a lot of these movies, they also just barely made even. And that was, that's enough to at least, you know, pay back, uh, pay your actors, pay that stuff. But once this stuff went into video, that's where they made more, way more money. Uh, but it, again, it wasn't enough to save them from themselves. And so, um, yeah, there is uh, Marina. Um, and she she was just so beautiful there. Look at her. So young. <laughs> um, and uh, then we have um, this part where they began to do some distribution um, 
so of course they did not do uh, Conan the Barbarian, but they did handle uh, distribution to different uh, parts of the world, like uh, making sure that these uh, these movies got to different parts of of the world that where other studios couldn't reach. Okay, so let's see. The one that's really kind of funny uh, to me, though, that I wanted to get into. Oh, hold on a second. Uh, Gary says Marina Sirtis uh, was also in uh, Michael Werner's uh, Death Wish 3. Yes, she was. <laughs> and that scene was horrible. Um, yeah, she describes um, his treatment of her in that scene is just um, very, very uh, inhumane. Inhumane. Um, yeah, very inhumane. Uh, let's see. Now, okay, Sahara is the. <laughs> Sahara, did you guys see Sahara? This movie, oh my goodness. <sighs> Sahara is just one of those films that, um, you know, it has a very, like, the premise of it is very Harlequin romance. And uh, it's like, they tried. They tried. <laughs> they tried. <laughs> it was uh, sort of like it, Blue Lagoon. Definitely um, has very similar. There's like a similar flavor to Blue Lagoon. There was also another movie that came out about this time. I forgot the name of it, um, but it starred Phoebe Cates. Um, and it was very close to that story as well, uh, where there was sort of a bad guy to, uh, to deal with. I forgot the name of it. Oasis or something. Uh, I don't know if you guys know of that one. Um, but, uh, this one happens to be, uh, I, I would say it is a guilty pleasure, if you will. Uh, if you are if you are into like corny romances, that's what this is. So this is Sahara 1983, directed by Andrew McLagan uh, and starring Brooke Shields, uh, Lambert Wilson, Forrest uh, Buchholz, uh, John Reese Davies was in this, and John Mill Mills was also in this. And uh, it had a, an original uh, musical score composed by Ennio uh, Marconi. Um, so this is really um, Cannon's attempt to make a an Oscar-winning film, according to uh, Menachem. Uh, Brooke Shields was going to win an Oscar for this <laughs> movie, and. Um, it, it was really, if you watch this thing, it's just really, um, it does play out like a romance novel. It really does. Like one of those um, really, you know, those those romance novels from, uh, that you would get back in the 80s uh, with uh, Fabio on the cover. And so like even with the cover of this poster, it, it it does have that kind of feel to it, right? Like a uh, romance whiskey away kind of thing. And um, yeah, it was very it was very interesting. Let's just say that it lost um, a lot of money. It was <laughs> the budget was twenty five million, and they only made back one uh, one point four million. Very big, huge loss on that. Um, at least they put the money behind the film. That's all I can say. But uh, you could hardly tell uh, by watching it, uh, unfortunately. Now, the movie that they really struck gold with was Breakin. Um, Breakin really, really did something special for them because um, it was, um, they found out that um, Beat Street was being made at about the same time. So as soon as they heard that, 
they um, went on a sort of a, a time crunch to tr to try to make sure to come out with a movie before Beat Street. And they did. They really rushed it. But um, let's see. <laughs> so they made Breakin. And it was, um, it's actually an interesting thing because if you ask some people if they, which one do they prefer, uh, Breakin or Beat Street, uh, a lot of people, you know, who are just like on the outskirts, not really, um, you know, just looking at a movie, they would pick Breakin because it's more commercial, actually, which is kind of surprising that they made this like kind of commercial type of movie um, and sort of struck a nerve. But uh, Beat Street was really um, more grounded and more, there was more intellectual stuff going on in that movie, uh, more drama going on in that movie. And so if you wanted a feel good movie, you went to break in. Uh, and then <laughs> they had different names for this. Uh, so that way they was, um, they, they could uh, take advantage of um, different like words for the different uh, regions that they were selling this to. So uh, it has uh, three different titles, uh, Breakdance and Break Street. And this is really what happened was that there was a documentary that came out that was about break breakdancing. And uh, some of the people from uh, that documentary are actually in this film. And so he was just like, get me those guys. And, just like, uh, the, and that was pretty much it. And um, I think it it was a formula. They finally, I think they, they thought that they had a formula, at least with this. And it worked um, on, on this particular thing. So this was um, a breakdancing themed musical film directed by Joel Silberg, uh, starring... Uh, Lucinda Dickey, and um, she did other films with uh, the the company, which we'll talk about eventually. We've got uh, Adolfo Shabadu uh, Quinones, and then we have Michael Boogaloo Shrimp Chambers, and uh, Ice T made a small appearance in the film, I believe, as a DJ. Uh, so it, it's really kind of cool because you have all these. Uh, people, uh, I, I remember being a kid and watching this and going, oh my God, those guys are so cool. So look, guys, I mean, all the stuff that people can say about uh, this this company and maybe they didn't, their entire purpose for making this was to capitalize off of a craze that was going on. They were there at the right time and a lot of people were exposed to um, uh, this art form uh, from a wider perspective, and also a lot of people saw the stuff that was going on in this movie and wanted to copy it and wanted to learn from it. I mean, even I was trying to do some of the moves. I mean, I did some of them, but not, I didn't get all of them. <laughs> like, the, I could never spin on my head, that's for sure. But I, I tried, I did try. Um, let's see what you guys are saying. Botanical Brothers said break in with the joint. Um, Straw Dog 78 says, Break in two electric boogaloo is my jam. Um, uh, Botanical Brothers says, Beat Street, King of the uh, of the Beat, rocking that beat from across the street. <laughs> uh, and uh, it says, I dig the credits theme song, There's No Stopping Us. Wasn't that great? That soundtrack was really great. And I'm going to talk about that too. Um, that That's the next thing I was going to say. Uh, let me. Uh, I'm going to say this film soundtrack featured the hits Breakin', There's No Stopping Us by Ollie and Jerry, uh, Freak Show on the Dance Floor by uh, Barquez, and the UK Top 20 hit Body Work by Hot Streak. Uh, and uh, Breakin' was one of the final canon, canon film productions released by MGA. And so, so they were in a a, uh, a partnership with MGA for a little while. Uh, let's see. 
and I think they had they had some more things later on with MGA. Um, and then Moonbeam uh, eighty seven says it was the nineteen fifty one version of uh, Christmas Carol. Alistair, and, uh, then he died uh, five years later. Okay, yes, we're but remember we're gonna stick to the topic. Uh, thank you for the information. We will talk about the Christmas Carol eventually one day. We will talk about it one day. Because <laughs> um, that is one of my favorite films. Uh, Botanical Brothers says, I would like to see RNG pop and lock. <laughs> no, the, the bones won't let me do it. <laughs> uh, but I sure did try. And Brogu says, I can see you spinning in your head. I I tried but it just didn't work um i it just i just didn't have the talent for that um and um and there's uh there are all the people all the break dancer dancers here now the the actress who plays um the main um uh character lucinda dickey said that in the movie there was a lot of um there was a lot of um, animosity in the dialogue and all of that stuff um, that was, you know, from for the characters was actually happening in on set. Like they they did not like each other. Like none of the people like each other, and it was very 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 sad. Very very sad to hear that they did not all get along. But that's uh we reality i mean you know people aren't gonna always get along but um yeah the all of the stuff you know that that was happening on screen she said it is pretty much the same thing that was happening off screen so <laughs> pretty uh pretty crazy um let's see uh, oh, look, John Walker's here, says hello, RNG and everyone in the chat. And Stradog's, uh 78 says Ozone Turbo, Special K, Legends. Oh, wow. So cool. <laughs> so cool. Um, and I mean, look at the, I, I just love the outfits that, that these guys are wearing, too. I mean, Oh, I miss that style that everybody just dressed like they were rock stars. It didn't matter who you were. You just dressed like you were a rock star. <laughs> like you were just about to go on stage. It's like, oh, no, I'm just going to the store to buy milk. <laughs> oh, man. And they're doing some heavy posing there. Um, let's see. Um so the next one I wanted to talk about was Sword of the Valiant. And this is a very unique film. I would always catch this film uh, on late night uh, TV. And it was uh, maybe a tad too long, a little tad too long. Uh, <laughs> Botanical Brothers says, the village people on steroids. <laughs> yeah. They were, they were, and um, uh, and one of the things I loved about um this movie that entranced me really was um, uh, Sean Connery is in it. He's and he's just being so mysterious and weird in it. Uh, it's a it's a fantasy saga, and um. Also, uh, Miles O'Keefe is in there, and I, I kind of had a crush on uh, on Miles O'Keefe. I was like, "Oh my God, who's this person?" <laughs> and so, the sword of the valiant, the legend of Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, often shortened to Sword of the Valiant, nineteen eighty four, directed by Stephen Weeks and starring Miles O'Keefe, Trevor Howard, Peter Cushing, that was in it, and Sean Connery. The film is loosely based on the poem Sir Gawain and, and the Green Knight, written in the late 14th century, but the narrative differs substan substantially. It was the second time Weeks had adapted the traditional tale into a film. His first effort was Gawain and the Green Knight in 1973, which 
I just learned about in, in from doing the research, and I I definitely want to see that film. I definitely want to see that film. I actually want to see all the um, you know uh, authorian uh, films, just because that that time period does fascinate me quite a bit. And um, then we have this one, Bolero, which is was a colossal failure, if you will. Um, but the intention was uh, was not to do that, of course. Um, they always say that no one intends to make a bad film. Bolero 1984, written and directed by John uh, Derrick, and, starring Bo Derrick. And um, this was uh, Bo Derrick um, really declaring independence from uh, the other studios, really always asking her to do one type of film. And um, I, I believe she, there was, uh, she was in 10. Uh, with Dudley Moore, and um, yeah, she just wanted something a little bit more, um, where where she was gonna be like the main character and really have more of a say of what the story was gonna be about. But it seems as if um, this it was mostly all very risque on set, very, um, and, and it was uh, set in the twenties, so it it had like a. People couldn't really figure out what was going on with that movie. It just could not figure it out. Um, so uh, it was just seemed like uh, it was wild and disconnected and artistic, very, you know, very um, artistic at the same time. And also, uh, some people may have found it very disturbing because there's a very young girl in the in the film, um, and so. It, that that movie itself was um, definitely a, uh, a what you would call a flop. I hate to say the word, but they considered a flop. And the film was critically panned, earning nominations for nine Golden Raspberry Awards at the fifth Golden uh, Raspberry Awards, and and ended up winning six. Um, so yeah, that was uh, that was too bad for Bo Derek because I like you know when you. When you have somebody who's really trying to, you know, do something unique and different, it uh, you want them to succeed. But uh, unfortunately, this didn't really hit the right note. And uh, Brogu says that I I told you that I saw it back in 1984 and can't look at people in the eye to this day. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's it's one of those films where it's just like what oh. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> um okay, so now we've we we're deep into um 1984 and there's a lot of these films um I really want to try to see like Thor the Conqueror. Um really want to see that, but um let's uh I've highlighted a couple of the uh, uh ones that I wanted to see. Um so let's see. The Exterminator 2. Now, I didn't get to see the first Exterminator, but this is, um, uh, is Exterminator 2, um, directed by Mark Bunsman, and the additional scenes were directed by William Sachs, starring Robert Ginty uh, and uh, Mario Van Peebles, who did a lot of work with Canon Films, uh, and Deborah Geffner with cameos by uh, Irie Gross and John Tuturo. Uh, and the problem with this film was that it had uh, a lot of, lot of reshoots uh, happening in the film. They just was never, um, they were never satisfied with it. And so it just barely earned back what it, uh, it, 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 the budget it just bare like nobody really <laughs> got money from this as ever maybe once it got to video so that that's uh, a shame there um and uh, there's robert ginty um and so here we have one of the most famous of uh canon films ninja three the domination 1984 uh this one this movie is uh 
really unique in its own ways. Um, it's an uh, it's a a martial arts action horror film directed by Sa Sam Furstenberg. Uh, it stars Sho uh, Kasugi, Lucinda Dickey, Jordan Bennett, and James Hong is in this as well. Uh, like the previous films in the series, it was garnered a cult following. Uh, the budget was two million, and it earned seven point six uh, million. So that's not bad. Um, not a great success, but um, definitely, um, you know, did very made made a little profit. Made a little profit. Um, and uh, Moonbeam says, "All right, my chores are done. I liked Bo Derek and Tarzan, the Ape Man, and Bo Derek in the Ten Commandments." Oh, really? I didn't know she was in the Ten Commandments. <laughs> oh, tell me what year that was. What year was the Ten Commandments? Not the not the original thing. This must have been something else. But yes, I remember her in the, um, the Ape Man. And The Hidden says the second uh, Exterminator 2 movie was more of what audiences saw in one. That's, yeah, that's probably why it does, didn't do as well. And um, a mechan mechanical brother says, I apology, uh, apologize to distress. We partially discuss about favorite movie production company fanfare themes be possible. Um, what? I'm, I'm sorry. What is it? Um, apologize to digress with partially... Um, with a partially discussion about a favorite movie production company fan be possible. Um, uh, I'm not sure what that means. <laughs> uh, Botanical Brothers says, during one of our future podcasts, uh, one of my favorite is Universal Studios Fanfare. That's absolutely possible. Yes, absolutely. That's absolutely possible. Um, and so and here's some more um stills from the movie um i just wanted to say that um uh quentin tarantino says that this is one of his favorite canon films so <laughs> obviously i mean there are some really interesting visuals in this and uh there's a there is creativity there there is creativity there and there is it is entertaining it is entertaining um thank you rng yes yeah, sure i i i don't i don't know when but <laughs> uh yeah because i don't i don't know when but maybe some other i'll figure out something but this is what we're talking about right now, <laughs> the Canon uh, films. Um, let's see. So we've got Missing in Action, 1984, directed by Joseph Zito and starring Chuck Norris and Emmett Walsh and uh, James Hong, Vietnam veteran uh, Colonel Braddock, escaped a, um, escaped a, a prisoner of war camp 10 years earlier, returns to Vietnam to find American soldiers listed as missing in action. Uh, this movie was huge. Uh, the budget was a uh, uh, million point five and the box office was 52 million in return. So that's incredible. That That's, I'm sure they were all like, super excited when that happened that's their biggest uh, box office right there uh so that's incredible and uh then we have break into electric boogaloo which was really released <laughs> seven months after the original film they wasted no time they were like no we've got to hop on this right away and continue to um you know, to sell, sell, sell this product. They weren't playing around. And so <laughs> I, I love the enthusiasm to make money on this. Uh, but the, um, uh, and, and it paid off for them. Look, the budget was 3 million and it made 15 
at the box office. That's a great return. So they were they they found something, uh, a, you know, a good way to do it, and they were just spending a little bit more than normal, right? Uh, Three million is is not, you know, typically how much they would spend. So they're spending a little bit more and getting a big uh, return at the box office. And I think that's where things started to turn for them as far as like, okay, this we're going to start um, making things with bigger budgets. Um, uh, so a couple a lot of these I, I, I've never seen and I eventually will see at some point. Uh, but we've got uh, Missing in Action 2 uh, and uh, let's see, there's Missing in, in Action 2. Uh, and Stradog78 says, I believe in the beat. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, and uh, this, uh, yeah, so uh, this it wasn't, okay, so this is actually a prequel. And it's a prequel because this movie was actually supposed to be missing in action, the first movie. And they kind of shot both of the movies at the same time, the first movie and the second movie together. Um, and when they, pe they put both of the movies together, they were like, wait a minute, the second one is way more exciting and fun. So let's put that one first, change the name, to uh, missing in action, and then do the set the first one as the second one as a prequel. So it's called missing in action uh, to the beginning. I I love that change um, because they, you know b business wise they they had to make that change. Uh, it wasn't as good, but I think at the same time there may have been a way to kind of tweak that that second movie you know while while the first one was making itself in a success fix the problems that is uh in from missing missing in action too that that uh that prevented it from being better uh but i i don't think they did that <laughs> they just went on ahead so this was uh starring chuck norris uh stephen williams and soon teckel and uh it was directed by lance hool and written by Steve Bing, Larry Levinson, and Arthur Silver. Uh, the budget was two point four million, and it they came away with a win here, uh, with ten minute million at the box office. So they they're actually like I think they're they're they they think that they figured out the formula. Like <laughs> at least they can get a profit, right? They get at least they can get a profit. Uh, and uh, Brogu says, Chuck Norris once kicked a horse in the chin. Its descendants are now known as giraffes. <laughs> and um, Gary could have used break uh, um, could have used a breakdancing scene. <laughs> Fishing in action too. <laughs> maybe, maybe. Uh, one of them says, um, uh, John Derrick. Uh, he was in Ten Commandments, nineteen fifty six. John was in that with. Charlton Heston. He was Joshua. Bo was just being born, and John was her second husband. He died in 1998. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, and the hidden says, Retro Nerd Girl, at 242 your last, your, your last show, someone in the chat said, We taxpayers get higher taxes for, for Warner Brothers' failed background live, live action. Which never got released is is that true? I don't know. At that I don't know the hidden. Um, not sure. But um, yeah, I'm not sure about what's. I'm I I don't know. <laughs> that you'll have to look into. Um, and Mumbin says Bo Derek was 30 years older than Bo. Oh, that's that's interesting to know. And. Um, uh, rap in 1985. Uh, this was technically supposed to be um, break dancing three or break in three, uh, but it was rapping. Uh, and 
it had like a, a little dramatic, it was kind of dramatic in, in, in a way, directed by Joel Silberg, starring Mario Van Peebles and Kadeem Hard Hardinson. Um, and uh, there's uh, quite a bit of people in this too. Um, Eric LaSalle is in this as well. Um, and Ice-T is also in this movie, uh, making an appearance. But um, this movie is not ended up not being connected to the break-in movies at all. Uh, it was it was <laughs> one of those things they were like, okay, yeah, we've got to make a third break-in movie, uh, and they came up with rapping, <laughs> and then it ended up not being even uh, close to it. But it did not do very well at the box office. Um, but here we come to my favorite. Uh, of the canon films and uh, a, a movie that really changed, like I would say had a really big impact on me, huge impact. Seeing this movie kind of opened my mind up to the possibilities of uh, science fiction and how far it could go, how weird it can get. And uh, I just absolutely adored it. Um, and uh, we have, um, oh, look, we have Luminara 843 in the house. Hello. Hi there. How are you doing? <laughs> so great to have you here. And, um, and Brogu says, in Barbie 2, Chuck, uh, in Barbie 2, Chuck Norris is, is going to steal her camper and to, and the two of them will go off and fight terrorism. Oh, is that is that true? Is that a scene in there? I hope you're not spoiling it for me. I'm supposed to see it tomorrow. I'm <laughs> finally going to the theater, guys. <laughs> um, yeah, it, it failed at the box office, unfortunately. But um, and this is one of my favorite uh, movies. It was directed by Toby Hooper. Uh, the legend. I love this director. Uh, adapted by B Dan O'Bannon and Don Jacoby, uh, based on the Colin Wilson 1976 novel *The Space Vampires*. <laughs> starring it's it, the movie is starring Steve uh, Steve Wilsback, uh, Peter Firth, Frank Finlay, and Matilda May. Um, and also Patrick Stewart makes a, an appearance in the film. It was really amazing uh, for me to see him in there. And I think Matilda May is just one of those uh, like absolute incredible beauties of the nine, uh, of the eighties that uh, how she did this film was just uh, <laughs> it's a marvel to me and the way she's so confident uh, I just loved her so much in this. Um, and the, for me, the story was also very intriguing. Uh, you know, I'm not a fan of zombies, but the way they put, portrayed them in this movie had a lot of um, things. And so you have uh, vampires, we've got space, we've got zombies, we've got, you know, <laughs> all this weird stuff going on. It's a wild, wild movie. And I just loved every moment of watching this film uh, when I first saw it. Um, Moonbeam says, I was nine in 1985. Thundercats was, popul was a popular cartoon. And uh, Puff Comics 83 says, hi, RNG chat. Happy Friday. Oh, great to see you, Puff Comics. So good to see you. And um, uh, Moonbeam 87 says, yay, I'm still on a cinema dry spell. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm on one too, but I just wanted to see uh, Barbie. is just intriguing me a lot. I wanted to see it because I am a big, big fan of Barbie in general but i just um my curiosity is just like i need to see it i need to see it <laughs> and gary says uh, matilda may had a big impact on me. of course she did <laughs> gary. of course she did <laughs> i mean she had a big impact on everybody <laughs> and uh strut uh something it says life force definitely deserves a rewatch yes rewatch it this week um 
you know, it, it's just one of those golden films. Uh, I would say a guilty pleasure um, and with an emphasis on the pleasure. It's really, um, if you're interested in like really good sci-fi movies that are different, that, that are different, this is one that's really, really different. I mean, uh, you can't get any stranger than this. <laughs> And then, um, so we got a lot more in 1985 was a huge year for them. These guys had so, so many projects. Um, we've got American Ninja 1985 stars, Michael Dudikoff, uh, Steve James and John Fujiko Fujikoa. Uh, and it had a mixed reception, but it was fine. It was a financial success. Uh, and since then, it has been considered a cult film. It is really one of those films that um, really took uh, Michael Dudikoff's um, career to the next level, uh, made him a, a name, uh, really, because he had been doing a lot of small roles here and there, uh, mostly comedies. And so uh, when you see him in American Ninja, he is really doing his best uh, to really like entertain you. He's doing his best to entertain you. He, just his movements, everything. He was just just doing it up, and I love to see that. I love to see that energy in uh, with actors who are who are just giving one hundred percent. And uh, the budget was uh, one million and earned ten million at the box office. What a great uh, profit on that! Uh, you know, ten x that baby. That's wonderful. Uh, they, they didn't spend too much on it, and they got a nice profit. That's uh, the smooth running of a uh, uh, of a a studio movie studio is to make a film uh, for a, a small amount. And to receive a profit on it, uh, and uh, then we get uh, this bombastic film here, Invasion USA, 1985, directed by Joseph Zito. We were giving him some flowers earlier. Let's see what else. You, what you guys have to see? I see some activity in the chat. Um, Moonbeam 87 says Barbie Girl by Akko is interesting song. Uh, yes, but it's not on topic. Let's try to stay on topic, <laughs> please. Um, Keith E says, Moonbeam, please say, thank you, Keith E. <laughs> You're going to be, yes, stay on topic because it, it it's not only is it throwing me off, um, people came here for, uh, to talk about Canon films. We've got to talk about Canon films, um, if that's our topic. And so we'll, we can talk about Barbie Girl Aqua song very soon. We will, we will talk about those things though. We will talk about that. Um, just when it's time um and uh and oh but look uh, uh moonbeam is also helping me to say the words out fujioka there we there we go see thank you <laughs> let's stay on topic uh botanical brother says was jim kata uh a canon film i don't think so i don't think it was uh i don't think so uh, I, I'm not absolute certain, but I don't think it was. Um, from my research, I did not see it on the list, though. Puff Comics says, uh, love American Ninja films. You know, they were really, I thought they were really good. And they, you know, they spoke to America, right? They spoke to American uh, young boys. And uh, just, it was specifically had a dialogue with them. Um, and just... Uh, Everyone, anyone can watch that film and feel inspired. I wasn't an American young boy, but I love that those movies. <laughs> um, so it was it was really interesting uh, to see that. And plus, more American ninja. Like, how is that possible? You're 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 wondering. You know, it's sort of like Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Like, what is that? Uh, you've got it. It's already it gets makes you curious as, as to what it is. Um, you know, that kind of stuff doesn't work today because it's not as novel. It's not a novelty anymore, but it was back in the early 80s. Um, and uh, Puff Comics says, uh, Richard Lips hates Christmas. Uh, 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 
uh, I don't know. What uh, I, oh, Richard Lynch is in this movie. Yes, he's in this movie. Um, so I'm going to read the things for this movie. Um, so Invasion USA 1985, directed by uh, Joseph Zito, a retired CIA Matt Hunter, Chuck Norris, is forced back into the business when a villain from his past reemerges, Soviet Mikhail Rostov, uh, Richard Lynch, a terrorist who Matt once caught and wants to exact, exact revenge. Um, and that one, they did spend a bit of money on it, uh, $12 million. Uh, but they made it back $40 million at the box office. That's pretty incredible. And uh, guys, the, the numbers that I'm really sharing with you are domestic numbers. So that's not worldwide. Uh, so they made a, they made some more money worldwide. Uh, Stradogs78 says, imagine Joseph Zito directed Spider-Man, which was the plan after Invasion USA. Oh, yes. And um, Michael Dudikoff was supposed to be <laughs> Spider-Man. <laughs> yes, that would have been interesting. Uh, Joseph Zito probably would have done a, a good job. Uh, and But here's the other thing, too, I wanted to say about Invasion USA, right? Is that uh, a much uh, a much deeper involved story was originally supposed to be uh, uh, was was filmed and was ready, but it was edited by Menachem Golem. So he took out almost all of the connective tissue to this deeper storyline that would have made this movie a lot more, um, you know, palatable for a lot of people. For some people, they're like, what is going on? It's confusion because of the way it's edited. And so uh, that's that's kind of, the problem with with this movie i guess the, the problem was the editing and um yeah that uh, it's unfortunate because they really did make the movie well it's just it's just missing those those pieces of uh of uh of detail so that that was that's kind of sad it's sad to hear that um that it was edited down to the barest Ability. The hidden says, "A retro girl. Uh, during your last show, you said that money profit. Yeah. Okay. So, I'm. I'm. I appreciate you um, mentioning that, but I really want to stay on topic. Please, I'm not asking it again. Everyone, please stay on topic." This is. It's getting to be. I can't concentrate on what we're doing. Um, when there's, it's time for us to talk about that stuff, which we'll get to do, we can do that. Or you can send me an email. I have my email in the description. Send me an email and I will try to answer your question as best as possible. But I, I, um, I really think we need to stay on topic. And uh, uh, John Walker says, Michael Dudikoff film called Avenging Force. He p plays the character called Matt Hunter. It's the same uh, as Chuck Norris in Invasion USA. Yes. <laughs> I, I, we're, th yes, I, I, I hear you. you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Just everybody stay on topic, please. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm totally. <laughs> it's just that I, I'm. Um, oh no, it's Moonbeam, you were put in timeout. Okay. <laughs> so, yes, guys, just stay on topic because it, it's really important. I told everybody in the beginning to stay on topic, so stay on topic. Thank you. <laughs> um. And uh, let's see. Yes, yeah, so I think I'm finished talking about Invasion USA. You guys are not liking uh, Invasion U USA. Um, it, let's move on to Death Wish 3. Uh, Death Wish 3 um, is all I could say is that it's one of 
as they kept going <laughs> they kept going with this idea um and this is really like a little it, it becomes a little bit numbing when you have the same idea over and over and over again but it was a formula that kept making them money uh, people were still always going to the theater to see this even when they weren't making as much as they were making before they were still making a profit so um they're back again at it again for uh, death wish 3 1985 directed and edited by michael winner and stars uh, charles bronson as the vigilante killer paul kersey against new york street gangs with the nypd uh, to save money, the movie was shot in London, dressed as New York City. Uh, and always, also, as I mentioned before, uh, uh, what is her name? Uh, Marina Sirtis is also in this movie. One, one heck of a horrible scene. Um, she's, she was definitely um, not happy to do that scene, but uh, it, it was... Um, pretty grueling on the set but that that scene is just horrifying um and uh then we get to uh <laughs> king solomon's minds 1985 and this is a movie i actually have enjoyed many 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 times uh it was very good uh to me when i was a kid now as a grown-up it's a little bit uh <laughs> Gary says, uh, Paul Kersey is cursed. I think so, too. He's like never going to live his retire. He's just going to keep shooting up everybody. Uh, but it, the guns kept getting bigger. The it just kept getting wilder and just insane. Uh, and um, and people kept going to the movies to see it, which is like uh, they didn't get the message like, hey, we, we should stop making these movies by now. <laughs> they just kept going. Uh, so we've got King Solomon's Mind, 1985. Now, the, the thing that they said about this movie that's really interesting is that uh, they wanted to make an Indiana Jones type movie. And uh, it, it, it doesn't really come off as an Indiana Jones type movie but i did enjoy it for the adventure i love adventure movies and this really did the thing they hired uh richard chamberlain to star in the movie and uh the movie romancing the stone was out and uh Menachem, uh said kept saying get that stone lady and they got uh, Sharon Stone, they, that's who they thought that they, that he meant, the stone lady. But he was really meaning, um, <laughs> he was really meaning someone else. So it, it was the, the actress from, uh, from Romancing the Stone. Uh, just for, her name is on the tip of my tongue and I can't remember it. But anyway, um, once she, she was, uh, hired, she had such a horrible time on the set and she just, hated every minute of it and did not get along with anybody nobody got along with her and it was a disaster and uh, not only did they make the film once they made it two hilarious times and she just she hated every every minute of it um but i and on the other hand it was um really a, a lot of fun to me i thought it just has a few moments where uh they didn't quite tie all the scenes together well and some of the the dialogue is a little sketchy and so um the film adept it's the film adaptation of the 19 uh the 1885 novel of the same name by h Ryder haggard it stars richard chamberlain sharon stone herbert lom and john Rhys davies also in this film as well uh, adapted by Jean Quintano, uh, Quintano and James R. Silkey. Um, directed by J. Lee Thompson. Uh, there was a scratch of a... Of a ca thank you, Stradog. Kathleen Turner. Thank you, Rogu. <laughs> Kathleen Turner. I don't know why it, she skipped uh, my, um, my vocabulary there for a second. Um, so uh yeah they they spent a million uh 11 million dollars on the budget and made 15 back so it was it wasn't a triumph 
but it was enough to um, to to pay for everything and also uh, a, a little bit off the top. Um, um, and Moonbeam says, Marina Sirtis, Councillor Deanne Troy, um, uh, Kathleen Turner was in Romancing the Stone. Oh, yeah, Kathleen Turner was in Romancing the Stone, yes. Um, yep, and we I think we mentioned that um, Marina was uh, Deanna Troy uh, from uh, the um, Star Trek The Next Generation. All right, so let's see. Um, mama, mama, yeah. uh, Runaway Train is the next one, which is um, a movie that has a lot of, um, is highly regarded, actually. And for a lot of people, I'm, I'm actually looking forward to seeing this. I haven't seen this yet. Um, so while I'm doing this, I'm actually learning about a lot of films that I never, I've, I've never, never even heard about. Uh, Runaway Train, 1985, directed by Andre, ooh, this is a Konchakalovsky, and starring John Voight, Eric Rod Roberts, uh, Rebecca De Mornier, and uh, John P. Ryan. Um, based on the original 1960s screenplay by Akira Kosawa, um, Kosa, Kurosawa with the uncredited contributions by frequent um, Kurosawa collaborators, uh, Hid, uh, Hideo Un, uh, Oguni and Raizo Kukushima. And the film was also... Uh, the feature debut of both Danny Trejo and Tommy Tiny Lister. Um, and uh, Tommy Tiny Lister was the president in The Fifth Element, if you guys remembered. Um, now, uh, it failed at the box office, however, was critically acclaimed uh, to the point of getting nominations for Best Actor, Best Supporting Actor, and Best Editing at the Academy Awards. I mean... That's big time recognition that this company has been trying to get for such a long time. This is, um, and we, we've seen this a lot, right? Movies that don't, aren't box office successes that actually um, get critical acclaim with Academy Awards, um, you know, um, the Emmys and all of those uh, incredible award shows. So that means something that's almost like the money, right? It's almost like the money because it's like street cred, <laughs> street cred. And so they, um, the, the, this was good for them. This was a good thing for them, even though they did not get a profit. Um, and some, some film companies, what they'll do is they'll, they'll just, um, you know, they'll know that they're, they have a movie that doesn't, you know, is not going to do well at the box office office but is going to get a lot of oscar buzz and that will increase the value of their studio this way when they start asking investors for money they'll be you know it, it will be um and with a leg up they will have leverage uh so um uh okay yes i got that um uh uh, and saw Runaway Train once. Uh, okay. Um, oh, we're going to find out what you think of it. Okay. And Straw Dog 78 says, Runaway Train intrigues me. I just remember the last shot. Okay. Uh, see, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing this. I hope I can get a copy of it. Uh, Moonbeam says, I liked Runaway Train. It's an interesting film. Oh, cool. Yeah, I want to see it because um, it looks interesting. Now, this is where we get to a lot of the, um, like the distribution and releasing era where there's a lot of films that they didn't actually uh, produce, but they just took on the um, the job of, uh, of, of just getting it out to different markets. And so one of my favorites is definitely com the Company of Wolves here. They, they did a lot of films, um, uh, which is it's just one of my favorites. And then Flesh and Blood, 1985, 
directed by Paul Verhoeven and starring Rutger Howard, Jennifer Jason Lee, and Tom uh, Burlington, Susan Terrell, Ronald Lacey, and uh, Br uh, Bruno Kirby, and Jack Thompson. Set in the year 1501 in Italy. And uh, uh, this is another one. I This is this movie I want to see, but this is not, um, it's just a straight Canon video only. It's not a uh, one that they produced either. Uh, and I don't even know how you would pronounce that, but it's Extro. <laughs> and I've always wanted to see this film. It's a British science fiction horror film directed by Harry Broom. Broomley, Davenport, uh, starring uh, Bernice Stegers, um, Philip Sayer, and Simon Nash. Uh, just interesting. Uh, it says, uh, when Tony grows up, he's going to be just like Daddy. <laughs> that sounds really crazy. Um, and Straw Dog says, oh, I own Flesh and Blood, but I didn't know it was canon. And other... Um, Another to add to the watch list this weekend. Yeah, I mean, it. they didn't produce it, but they did the distribution for it. So they, they had quite a few films that they didn't uh, produce. And then I believe they bought a library of movies that they were able to then redistribute and also add to their, their video library. Because at this point, video was in full, str string, uh, full stream and everybody you know, wanted a video. And so, of course, Canon was happy to oblige uh, with this distrib distribution. And Moonbeam87 says, wow, Canon was around in 1969. I remember uh, most of the 80s stuff. Yeah, um, yeah, they were they were around back then, but it was under different management, but it was, they were around uh, that early. I think uh, 1967 was when they formed. and. Um, Gary says flesh and blood is underrated. Yes, and it it does it is very provocative and so I think that's the one of the reasons why I know people don't want to talk about it is because there's some aspects of the film that's very very provocative. And uh and Moonbeam says yeah, extra. Yeah, I I really want to see this weird one. Um I know it's it's a horror movie and you know how I don't like horror movies that much, but this is from the 80s. Uh how scary is it going to be? <laughs> um, and so there's more. I see like Amityville Horror is not one that they actually um, made. That was done in the eight, uh, in the 70s. And so they just uh, distributed um, out to different um, regions. So let's see, like Dreamscape they didn't do. Now they did do uh, Delta Force. And uh, Delta Force was one of their, like, when people say uh, canon films, a lot of people think Delta Force. And Delta Force made a big splash. The budget was $9 million. So they, they said, okay, we're going to put down $9 million for this, this one. The return was $42 million. Like, that's a great deal uh, of profit. And so... Um, Th that this movie was worth it. Uh, Delta Force 1986, starring Chuck Norris and Lee Marvin in his final film appearance as leaders of an elite group of special operation forces personnel based in the real life U.S. Army Delta Force unit. Uh, directed and co written by and produced by uh, Manaham Golan. So he had his hands in all of it, he really did. Uh, and the film uh, features Martin Balsam, Joey Bishop, uh, Robert Vaughn, Steve James, Robert Foster, Shelley Winters, George Kennedy, and an uncredited Liam Neeson in an early role. Isn't that incredible? Um, <laughs> Shelley Winters uh, was really crazy in in that film. She's she's in every film. She's really plays that same character. Um, in her later years, and um, and she had a lot of problems taking direction from Menachem. Uh, so it's really interesting. Um, and Moonbeam says, "Renovate Train is free with ads on the platform." Oh, that's great! Yeah, we oh, great. Uh, 
So if anybody wants to see the runaway train, um, you can see it free, but with ads on the platform. Uh, and Brogu says uh, Chuck Norris was a golden goose for Canon Films. Oh, he was wonderful for them. Yes, wonderful. They It was a nice relationship between the two. Um, they helped him and he helped them. So, um, and, and I think what they liked about him was that he was an American uh, man's man. So he sold a specific, um, not only the, the genre of films for him, uh, but it, it, he sold also uh, the idea that they really um, uh, adored. I, they loved the idea of a, an American's man, man. Uh, so <laughs> that was uh, something that they enjoyed seeing. And um, yeah, what a film. Delta Force, and, and there it, it shadows a real life situation. Um, there was um, a TWA had a, a very horrifying situation back in the 80s um, with one of their planes and having a, like a hostage situation go down. And this movie is sort of the fantasy of how that we would have loved to have that whole thing work out. And so, and for many people, it was, uh, it, it was, uh, escapism, but also fantasy ism. And, uh, uh, just one of those, uh, movies that hit a, a soft spot for a lot of people. For some people it was too soon. Um, but for many people, they really enjoyed this kind of a film, um, to take control of a situation that was uncontrollable. Uh, you know, and I think this might be my last two slides or three slides left. Um, so we're getting to the point where they had signed on Sylvester Stallone. This was one of their biggest um, acquisitions, if you will, uh, to sign on this big celebrity uh, to to be their actor. This is you, you couldn't get any. Uh, more to the top than this unless you were going to get Arnold Schwarzenegger and Arnold Schwarzenegger it was it was like the top top uh, and so I've got Cobra in 1986 directed by George P. Cus uh, Cosmatos and written by Sylvester Stallone who's uh, Sylvester Stallone always was like very hands-on with his career and the stuff that he uh, was working on um, so he wrote this and also stars in the in the title role. He, uh, the film co-stars Rennie Santoni, uh, Brigitte Nielsen, uh, who at the time, I'm not sure if it was uh, they were married or if they were dating at that time, but they were together. And Brian Thompson as the Night Slasher. He was fantastic and is super scary and super creepy in this movie. It was just really uh, unbelievably creepy and Andrew Robinson. The film was loosely based on a, on the novel A Running Duck by Paula Gosling, which was later published as, a, um, as Fair Game and filmed under that title in 1995. Uh, the budget was $25 million, And my God, they must have been cheering because they made over $160 million at the box office. That is just incredible. And that was just in the U.S. So it was a big hit for them. Um, it, it, I love this movie. I went to see it. It was really great. I loved um, uh, Stallone in it. Um, loved. It's got all of the 80s um, motifs, if you will, because there's a a moment in the film where um, Brigitte Nielsen is playing a model and she's got all the different hairstyles and dresses of the 80s and it's just really, um, it's like taking a bite out of time. <laughs> and so it's really, um, had a lot of fun with that film. And I loved um, one of the theme songs. I don't, know if, I don't know if it was the theme songs, but uh, it was one of the songs uh, by Jean Beauvoir, uh, Feel the Heat. Love that song, played it to death. Uh, it was one of my favorite songs. I love that um, artist. 
and it was it was just a great thing. Cobra, yes, one beam eighty seven. <laughs> and Rogue says, I, I love Cobra. Thought it was uh thought his car was cool also. Yeah. Oh my god. I also thought that they were such a pretty couple. Um you know, he was like the man's man and then uh Brigitte Nielsen was just drop dead gorgeous. So it was really amazing. Oh my god, we have a, a visitor. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let me just uh, finish reading everybody's thing here. Um, iconic uh, Cobra uh, deserves a, a sequel. Ooh, I never thought of that. Um, or maybe even a prequel. And Moon Moon says, uh, Arnie and Salon were top dogs in the 80s. Yeah, they were, they were always battling for the top spot. And John Walker says, uh, Ford Mercury was a cool car uh, in Cobra. And uh, Straw Dog 78 says, feel the heat. And Botanical Brothers says, I remember that hostage situation when I was in grade school. Wasn't it scary? I mean, it's just heart-wrenching. Uh, only uh, thing is I didn't like about these action films is that they promoted street violence. Yeah, uh, I mean, that was the whole point of them. And uh, uh, and it, I don't know what to say. There's one part of me that likes them because they're, they are fake and they're supposed to be unrealistic and over the top unbelievable but at the same time hoping that nobody else thinks that hey that's something i want to do you know uh <laughs> it's like no it's supposed to be fantasy it's supposed to be uh, escapism uh gary says uh rennie Santoni and andrew robinson's were in dirty harry which uh influenced this movie really cool Thank you for that tidbit, Gary. Um, yes. And so we do have Lance in the building. He's in the green room right now. Um, and I'm just waiting to see if he comes back. Uh, he was he was here a second ago, but I don't see him on screen. So I'm going to give him a few moments to. Um, oh, OK. He's waving to me. All right. Uh, and. Uh, Okay, are you ready? Uh, nearly. Oh, hello. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> I, I may have to dash to the bathroom momentarily. Oh, okay. Um, I'm going to give you a few more moments left then. If that's right. I'm so sorry I'm so late, but um, where I went for my date, unbeknownst to me, was right next to a concert for this really big singer. I have no idea who it was. Some girl told me the name, but I didn't hear it. And every road was blocked. Every oh, road wow. was swarming was with people. Was it Taylor Swift? Uh, no, was somebody. The only on. I, I, it was a guy. Um, oh, okay. And, and and his song was playing in the pub that I was in on my date, and they said it's this guy. This is his song, and I said, "Who is it?" And she said, "Well, yeah, there." Yeah. I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> oh yeah, I haven't heard of that guy. Um, well, okay, I'm gonna let you go and um, do that. I'm gonna read a few um, more right, of the do, chats do that, that came I'll, up. I'll, I want to get my Canon stuff ready as well because I've got some Canon stuff that I All didn't right. show you before, as well as the other things I do. All right. All right. So I'll, I'll give, give you a shout in the. I'll give you a shout in the chat when I'm good to go. Okay. Oh, okay. Hopefully, I'll see it. I'm not sure if I will, but. Um... Uh, all right. Well, if needs oh, be, oh, I'll... just yeah. Oh, say say it in the in the yeah in the chat. Yes. In yes. The main chat. Yes. Okay. Uh, okay. So let me know in the main chat. Okay. I. Oh. <laughs> so. He will be back, <laughs> and let's see um, here. Uh, okay. So yeah. Thank you, Gary, for that really good information. And Moonbeam says Brigitte Nielsen was married to Salone December 15, uh, 1985 to July 13, uh, 1987. Thank you, Moonbeam. We really appreciate that. <laughs> and it says hi to Lance. We'll, we'll make sure that Lance knows that you said hi. Um, and um, here's a Unicorn Rampant Studios. <laughs> Gives us a seven dollar super chat. Thank you so much. So sorry I was distracted, but now I'm back on topic. Yes. <laughs> oh man. Okay. So um, let me see. This is a wonderful little break for me. Uh, maybe I could get a sip of my um, my little uh, 
drink over here. And uh, here's a special thank you from me, Unicorn Rampant Studio. Thank you. <laughs> I love that song. It's so groovy. <laughs> All right. Okay. So, yes, timing is everything. It really is everything. So, uh, now we've just finished with Cobra. We're gonna do uh, Invaders from Mars, 1986. I love this film. Directed by Toby Hooper, of course. Um, like I, I do love his sensibility. Uh, from a screenplay by Dan O'Bannon and uh, Don Jacoby starring Karen Black. Uh, it's a remake of the 1953 film of the same name. Uh, elaborate creature and visual effects were supplied by Dan Winston and Don uh, and John Dykstra. Uh, unfortunately, the film did fail at the box office. Um, and uh, uh, Botanical Brother says, "I'm amazed at the details of your podcast." Pod classes, RNG. Thank you. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. I I really put I put a lot of work. I stayed up all night long for this. I did. I stayed. I didn't get any sleep, guys. I wanted to talk about this and give these guys their roses because um, they did a lot for the film industry um, and films in general, even though um, their methods may not have been pristine and the video, the, the movies may not have been all uh, Oscar worthy. There's, they still impacted the, uh, the culture and pop culture and uh, little little girls and boys who grew up to be uh, really awesome people, like you and me. So, <laughs> all right. So um, the Outcast Creative is ready to go, and uh, let's see if we can get him on. There you go. <laughs> hey, just in yeah. time to talk about Invaders from Mars, which is oh great. It's, uh, I mean, I saw this at the cinema. And here's the vinyl soundtrack. I really like the the, the music for this uh, this movie. Um, so uh, it's this soundtrack is super rare. It's, I mean, getting hold of it on vinyl probably would be impossible. Um, but I saw this movie with my my very first girlfriend. We saw it at the Canon, Aww. Oxford Street, and I remember that we went specifically to see it for my birthday. And um, I, I was a big fan of the original film. There was a BBC Two season retro oh, yeah. sci-fi movie season, and they did this. They did um, It Came From Outer Space, which is a movie I think we established you haven't seen, which is an excellent film, really mm -hmm. good film. You'll love it because I know you like like the films from this era. Uh, and so the original was black and white. Yeah. And um, they paid a lot of homage to the original. This This image with the fence is very, very iconic. Yes, it is. And the, you know, the, the, the going over the hill, the whole thing of we're going to go over the hill, you know, with yeah. Timothy, Timothy Bottoms. And Timothy Bottoms hadn't acted for a while uh, when he did Invaders from Mars, and he was perfectly cast as, as the dad. The kid who, who, who played the kid in the movie, um, he's kind of the linchpin of the film. He's not a bad uh, kid actor, but this is the only movie he ever did. He never did anything else. Yeah, I thought he was great in it. No, I think I think he's he's not bad. He's he's yeah. not he's not up there with um some of the other Hollywood kids who were working mm -hmm. at that that uh, around this kind of era, like the the lad who did Wrath of Khan, who'd been in Little House on the Prairie, and I follow him on Facebook. I forget his name right now. Um, he wasn't quite up to those veterans because I, I think this was like his first and only job. But for a first acting time, green kid, uh, he was he would did a really good job. Um, the score for this film, uh, which is done by David Stores, he had done loads of other stuff. I think he did a couple of other scores um, for Canon, um, but but it's a really good score, and and the music is very evocative. Like the, the final scene where the Marines oh, yeah. come up and they surround the pit, and it's that very dramatic, sort of almost military 
um, score is a, is a great scene. Oh yeah, um, I loved it. But the the thing I really liked about this movie was the production design. Um, I really liked the way the aliens were visualized. Again, they paid homage to the original film, but they kind of updated them and they made them different. And I think the kid at one point calls them the potato people. And, um, <laughs> I remember me and my then partner calling calling. We kind of nicknamed the film the Attack of the Potato People. Um, after the the line from the kid, and then they had that amazing kind of whirling thing that was m making the tunnels under the town. Yes, yes. And and it was great to see that because you didn't have that in the original. That was really nice. Um, and then you had the actress. I think she she passed away recently. Louise Fletcher. Um, oh yeah. Playing the teacher doing one two three four five, and and she did exactly the same thing in One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. And they, uh, the director um, was a big fan of that movie, so he just got her to repeat that. And, I mean, she kind mm -hmm. of almost played the same character. but Same um, character, yeah. But I think the, the film holds up. I watched it not that long ago, and it holds up really well today. And it, it's one of the few canon films that, that was not only really good when it, when it was made, but really stood the test of time. Mm -hmm. And they did a lot for the budget. I think they spent a bit more on this than some of the others. But the... The miniature work, like the, the scene where the lorry goes to the rocket and blows the rocket up, if you remember that, the aliens hijack the rocket and there's a, a rocket launch happening in the nearby military base and they take over a couple of the engineers and they send a, a truck uh, uh, filled with fuel to, to blow the rocket up because it's perceived by the aliens as a threat. That's all miniature work. Yeah. And it's really good miniature work and Canon didn't have a lot of miniature work in there their movies so i'd give this film even now i'd give this film like a seven or eight out of ten i really like it um, yeah it's really good I, 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 I adore that film absolutely i think i think I'm, did i miss invasion usa you did but wait before you get to that i just wanted you to know that moonbeam 87 says hi to you hello Hello, Moonbeam87 <laughs> slash Jack Kelly. Which yes. one of those are you? Um, yeah, it's... Uh, um, and uh, Botanical Brother says, I like this film, Favorite Lines. Um, I, don't, and... I, do, I don't get why this... Oh, look, there's me. I, yeah. I don't get why this film failed at the box office because it was a good movie. It was really well shot. Um, I mean, maybe it just wasn't sci-fi films of this type there wasn't a lot around that time of this kind of sci-fi, and it was very much a throwback oh. to the 50s sci-fi. Maybe people just didn't buy into it. I don't know. Yeah, it, it got – I don't know why people didn't like this one. Just wanted to say thank you to Botanical Brother. You're so sweet. Thank you. Oh. Yeah. And uh, Botanical says, uh, was the – uh, was the film The Boy's Dream or was it real? That's another piece to it. Was it? That, was it they, they, they set up the ending so they could have a sequel because mm -hmm. the film kind of comes full circle and it ends how it starts, doesn't it? With the alien mm -hmm. ship arriving again and, um, and yeah, uh, starting everything back over again. <laughs> yeah, and it, it's sort of a 360 movie, and I kind of like that about the film, um, as well. Um, yeah, Peter Ostrom. Um, only did Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. Um, that's right. I saw an interview with him recently. He's got a huge mo mustache. <laughs> yeah, the aliens are the aliens in this film. I love the aliens in this film. Yeah, I love that and... rain thing comes out on that long. Oh, that was really. And it's creepy. got its own little pod yeah. that it goes in, and yeah, I thought it was really creepy, but and perfectly done. And the the potato people, I thought they were done comedically at two at the same time so I, I laughed a little bit at their their design but i also thought it it does look like a you know alien they they don't look like uh they're not humanoid and i think that's also maybe another reason why people just couldn't connect with it i don't know i mean they're, they're, they're kind of like the worker bees in the movie but yeah. this movie wasn't trying to be aliens and i guess maybe it was overshadowed. I mean, Aliens was such an impressive movie. Technically, it pushed a lot of limits. Um, it was a very, very heavy action yeah. film. This movie had a, had, a, had a fair bit of action in it. Um, yeah, the, 
they did do a lot of the same things as the original, which yeah. I thought was it, 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 I, when I I saw I saw this one first, and then I saw the original, and I was like, wow, I can't believe they use you know like nearly the same scene. It's just done a little different. Yeah, yeah, and and it's I thought it was a great translation. Um, it is. Of, it's it, it it pays homage to the original without undermining it. If yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, not and many remakes do that. And like changing the whole, like a lot of times people will just change the whole premise of of yeah. a film when they uh, when they decide they want to reboot. And the Bat Channel is here. Hello, Bat Channel. <laughs> it's that bat time. <laughs> um, and uh, everybody's saying hi in the chat. So nice. Yeah, um, this is this is probably. I mean, if I've got my top three canon films, this would be in the top three for me. Okay. For sure. So I did go through a lot of the films so far. I'm going to go to the next. I think there's maybe one or two more left um, from my, my presentation here. And then after that, you can just go free for all and whatever you feel we like. Could, we, could jump, we, we could jump back on the ones I want to talk about. Yeah. Just and, and like. I, literally uh just maybe one or two more left let me just check yes oh, sure. this that, is the last one uh texas chainsaw massacre 2 1986 directed by toby hooper again uh it's a sequel to the the first one also directed by and co-wrote it uh co-written by uh hooper the film was written by um uh, L. M. Kit Carson and produced by carson uh Yo yoram globus Menheim, uh uh, Golan and Hooper as well, starring uh, Dennis Hopper, Caroline Williams, Will Johnson, Bill Mosley, and Jim Sidow. Uh, it was a financial success, but mixed reviews because of the pacing and tone. Uh, I saw this at the cinema as well, um, and I hadn't seen, um, at the time, I hadn't seen the original, and so me and my friend, we rented it out um, the week before we went to see uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2. And I found the first one really grim. Um, and it was banned. It was banned in the UK. There was a list of horror films that were banned and, and Texas Chainsaw Massacre was one of them. They were, they were called Video Nasties. Oh, okay. And we had this woman, this campaigner. She was a bit like your Anita Bryant. You know, she had a cause and was determined to get some political capital out of it. And um, she, was called, she was called Mary Whitehouse. And she led this political campaign to ban the video nasties and Texas Chainsaw Massacre was one of them. So of course that just increased the pirates going okay. around school. Um, but there was a list of video rentals that video stores were not supposed to stock. So the clever ones all kind of stocked them under the counter and only rented them to the regulars that they knew, but they could yeah. get money heavily if they did that. Of course, now a lot of these films are revered as classics of their yeah. groundbreaking classics of their time. I quite liked Texas Chainsaw Massacre too. It it, it kind of changed tone and, and yeah. went for the, went for the comedy, which actually I think was the right move. I think they they were half in and half out, and I think they should have gone all in. Um, yeah, yeah, that's my I, and it's a long time since I've seen it, but that's my recollection um, of it. Yeah, I think I think I may have seen the original like ages ago, but um, it, it's not something I would pick. It's not my taste, but um, definitely um, I, I was seeing some people talk about the second one and how funny it was, how much there, there's so much comedy in it. And there was like a billboard <laughs> that they had of, of uh, the entire this this uh entire um poster here is basically mimicking the breakfast club oh my god yeah <laughs> yeah which came out um one year earlier was yeah. it 85 i think so it was 85 well, it might, have been 80, might have been 84 actually yeah 85 or 84 and uh that's really kind of funny like oh so you you get the idea of what they were they were going for but um i think a lot of people were expecting to a horror movie um i think uh, they like were, a full-on horror movie. yeah the, the, the first film is very 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 dark 
and they they didn't use they use kind of non actors in the in the first film, um, or certainly actors that were not very experienced. So you kind of felt like you were really just kind of like a fly on the wall, lingering on these these Eek. these people's these travelers' unfortunate holiday. Eek. Yeah, um, I I wasn't. <laughs> I wasn't I wasn't having I was like no <laughs> I don't want to yeah I, I, I mean I did I found that film pretty disturbing and I watched it again probably about five years ago and I mean you know I just can't get that scene with the meat hook out of my mind yeah I don't I don't know what you're talking about don't explain it <laughs> okay. yeah. also I before we started I gave everybody the warning uh that we may have some um people who have their kids watching as well. So oh. we want to be very mindful of our language. Language, yeah. Yes. Please always remind me about that because I am Mr. Potty Mouth. So um, <laughs> it, it, it's good for you. Good for yeah, you. I, I got in trouble a couple of times. <laughs> yeah, I yeah, and I have just come in from a night out. You've got to remember I'm eight hours ahead of you, so <laughs> yeah. about. Okay. Um, uh, but yeah, that and any description of um, anything we, we're we're kind of dancing around um, some things. Yeah, let's let's not discuss the uh, the graphical. Yeah, depiction. and uh, Moonbeam says, yeah, the poster for Texas uh, Chainsaw Massacre too is just like the Breakfast Club, um, uh, a PG channel. Yes, we're trying to we're trying to do that. It's really tough though. It is rough. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> trying to be PG, but we're gonna give it a you know we're gonna give it our best try, and I think I'm done. We just have this one <laughs> thing where it's like you can it's definitely a a comedy, um, and yes, this is and the end of part two for the um, the slideshow. Uh, but don't but, leave because we're we're gonna go back and rake over some details. Yeah, so. Uh, Let's see if, how I want to do it. I'm going to pull this down. Okay. Okay. And then you will let leave the floor to you. You um, come up with whatever you um, you think you have to contribute. Well, um, two of the albums that I didn't show you before that I have, and I, you've probably discussed both of these films uh, before I got here. Okay. Was, um, I've got the vinyl soundtracks to rapping and yep. break down. Okay. Um, you did go over those two. Yeah, I mean, uh, listen, I was a break dancer in the eighties. Not a particular guys. Good one. <laughs> I, I would go and do all the body popping, and um, sometimes I'd even go and do it on the street for money and put a little hat out. And you know, as a teenager, you're always looking for ways to make extra coin. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and so I I used to lap all this stuff up and and of course the, the the two big films for me of this time it was Crush Grooving as well. Do you mm. remember Crush Grooving? Mm -hmm. But the two biggies were were Beach that Street. That song is in my head now. <laughs> Crush Grooving, yeah, body moving. Um, yeah. So of course you were kind enough to come on my stream about Beach Street where we had one of the original actors and about 70 of her friends pop in, um, which was a lot of fun. We didn't get to talk about the movie much, but it was a fascinating stream nonetheless. So Beat Street was kind of, for us, was the definitive. It was the proper break dancing movie. It was, it was, it was about real kids. It felt like it was real. It felt like the people in it were real. And yeah, I mean, it's almost like a documentary almost. I mean, and there's is. way there is, more drama, there way there more is, drama. Whereas Breakdance and, dare I say, Breakdance 2, which I think fits within the time span you're talking about. I think yep. Breakdance 2 mm -hmm. came out in... Yep, we did go over Boogaloo. Right, so Breakdance 2 is beyond <laughs> embarrassing. Um, I mean, it's quite a nice plot in terms of they're raising money for miracles, which mm. is basically a kid's creative arts center but then you know there's that there's that scene where one of them's getting chased by the builders because they're trying to stop the builders from knocking miracles down they end up in a hospital and suddenly we're in a scene from the tv series kids from fame and nurses are kind of like stripping their uniforms off <laughs> yes 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 i forgot about that yeah yeah and it, it, it's just nuts and it's so tonally that the, the, the movie is all over the place it can't decide whether it wants to be making a social statement about you know inner city kids and art centers closing 
or whether it wants to be a kind of on stage Broadway musical and it tries mm -hmm. to be everything yeah and it just doesn't work and it, it, you see you're kind of watching it and you're wincing and wh whereas in with Beach Street I was really rooting for those kids when the character of Ramo uh comes to what happens to him I don't want to get into spoilers but that really hit me emotionally you know when Ramo what happened with Ramo at the end of Beach Street at the end of Breakdance I was like well that was embarrassing so and I was yeah. a kid when I when I saw these movies so I should have been lapping them up and uh I wasn't um rapping was pretty similar um it's got that kind of naff scene at the end where they all go into a rap to convince the council not to do the bad thing yeah and the, rap, the council all end up kind of tapping their feet and joining in and that's just like never going to happen in real life security is going to get called you're going to get kicked out of the building um the council are not going to change their mind so um but you know it's kind of fun nonsense I guess they're okay, um, but that those movies of the Canon stable are not the rewatch ones for me. But I do do have those on vinyl. Um, the rewatch month ones for me are uh, um, Invaders from Mars. Definitely, I um, I own it. I don't have a Blu-ray of it. I don't know. If, I don't know if you can get a Blu-ray of um, Invaders from Mars um, with the same partner. I saw Delta Force at the cinema. Okay, yep, we did go over Delta Force. Yeah, I'll talk about it briefly. I mean, it's, it's got a great score. Everybody knows the score for Delta Force. You've got so many mixes of it on YouTube. It's a great score to put on while you're cleaning your house because oh. if you put the Delta Force theme on, you will hoover your house five times faster <laughs> than normal. <laughs> it is guaranteed. You'll be like, da na 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 da na I'm cleaning this window really fast. Da -na 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 -na. <laughs> People know what I mean because they've all done it. You know, you're putting Delta Force on, you're washing up really quickly. Don't break those glasses in the sink while you're jumping around to that Chuck Norris uh, funky beat. I mean, one of the things they try to do with Delta Force is that, that they, they surrounded Norris with a really good and, and experienced cast. And you had really good actors in here. You had Robert Foster, Lee Marvin, of course, um, the German lady whose name I forget. She was a very experienced actress. And when you watch her scenes, when she's doing the separation of the crew from the Jewish people to the regular citizens, and she's, look, I'm a German, I can't, I can't separate the Jews. This is, you're, you're recounting the 1940s. She really goes for it. And her acting in that scene is on, it's like it's in a different movie. Mm. And then you have Shelley Winters trying to match that, not quite, goes a bit too over the top. Not quite <laughs> that level. And then you've got a really young, I think it's Diana Delaney, who went on to do Homicide Life on the Street. She's one of the nuns on the plane, if you watch. Um, she went on to be a really big actress, and she's one of she's the young brunette nun on the plane of the hostages. Um, the first half of the film is is very, very gritty, very it's very real, it's very close to the real. This is based on the TWA yeah. hijacking. It's very close, all the events are placed very the scene where Bo Swevenson is, is talking out of the window, the dialogue all matches what actually happened, and the guy then comes out and fires a few shots at the bread. That all happened, and I remember watching all that. And the, But the second half of the movie is then really Chuck Norris zooming around on a bike and doing incredible silly things and, you know, jumping around. <laughs> yeah, I remember that. And, he's, like, just riding, and he's, like, boom, 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 boom. Like, he's just, like, shooting off. And there's a scene where he abseils, like he, he, he kind of holds onto a cord between two buildings and kind of comes down and he fires his Uzi between the, the, the two buildings, and like kills like 15 guys. There's another bit where Lee Marvin and Chuck Norris stand in the middle of the road with their bazookas. There's a shot of it oh, there. Yeah, yeah. Um, and this whole convoy is coming down the road with like about 200 bad guys on five vehicles and two tanks and APC. And they're, they're going, the bad guys have left. No, Commander, I think you're wrong. And they see them standing there. No one fires at them. They just let them stand there and look cool. No one fires at these guys who are obviously, like, not local yeah. and, and look like they're American commandos. And they just stay there and wait to get shot at. And they even take time to give each other a high five before they leave. So you kind of all the realism that you built up in the first hour of the film suddenly just completely vanishes. But you know what? I kind of didn't mind. It was fine. It was, it was, it was, it then became fun hokum. Mm -hmm. And I'm like you, I don't mind my fun hokum movie. 
But I, I, I think it was a shame because I think Delta Force could have been a really big win for Canon critically if yeah. they'd made the second half of the movie with the same grit as the first half. And actually, they could have they could have made it a movie where the Americans didn't win, and because the outcome of that was not successful, that TWA thing, you know, the hostages didn't all get released. It, it all went a bit horribly wrong, and the bad I think some of the bad guys got away. Uh, I'd have to check my research on that, but I think if they'd made the true story drama with all these same actors in it, the problem is that then there wouldn't have been a role for Chuck Norris. Oh, so yeah. that was. It, a, yeah, yeah, I think that's the thing. They they didn't want anyone to upstage him. Um, so no. Why would no. you want to? And his acting is, well, I would say, like, limited, but he's not, like, a deep, dramatic actor. But he's not he's not bad. He can hold his own, but it's just... Um, if he's if he's basically playing Chuck Norris, he's fine. Yeah, he's that's, that's what um, he's doing. <laughs> he's, we, we know. And the thing about it, I think that's really admirable about the the this particular movie is like they are going for the uh and i mentioned it before they are going for the unbelievable this is yeah. um escapism at its, at its utmost this is what they would this is what they would like the outcome to be yeah yeah uh, yeah it, yeah. It, I, I, yeah sort I of mean, like sort of like tarantino's um uh version once upon a time movie. in america yeah yeah it, the way he kind of plays around with the ending no and i mean look I, I listen i quite like the film i mean i'll probably watch it again pretty soon because i watched a load of movies for this stream and i've seen that oh, cool. so many times that was not one of the ones i needed to rewatch. <laughs> um, i mean i'll give it credit on a few so in particular the 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 chase with the van you know they've got the white van and the, after the priest kind of like commit suicide by jumping out the window because he's working for the Americans. He doesn't want to get caught. You then have this chase through this town, which was shot in Israel, I believe. And um, it's really well done. It's a really good car chase down lots of streets and the, the van gets really shot up, you know, proper practical effects. Um, so there's a lot in the film uh, to recommend it. The, the One other thing that people should look out for, and I wonder if other people watching notice this when they saw the movie and, and I, i'd really like to know if they did in the chat is you've got a shot with a a landing craft uh not the not the bit where it lands at night and all the delta force come out it's before that it's when they're getting ready to come and do the mission and an israeli guy comes and says to lee marvin are you guys ready and he says yeah 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 you did it last time we're going to do this one this time and it cuts to a shot of 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 various Delta Force operatives waiting. And they've, they're they all wearing perfect Ray-Bans. They've <laughs> all got perfect haircuts. And they must have got like the five or six best-looking extras and went, you guys all look hot. Right, you're going to be in this shot. And every one of those guys looks like a supermodel. Oh, I wow. mean, they look like the hot action man that you want to come and rescue you if you're in a bad situation and you're a lady. And, and clearly the director knew that. And he went, yeah, those six guys in that mm. shot. You're going to yeah. chew some gum. You're going to have some Ray Bans on. You're going to sit there. You're going to look macho and you're going to look cool. And when you watch that shot, it's like, you know, because I've been on sets and I'm a director. I can literally hear the director saying, Yeah, you sit there, you sit there, you sit there. And it's such a stage shot to make them look not only like really professional, but super sexy. Yeah. And it works. It works. Yeah. They all look great. Um, so I kind of like that. Steve James is really good in the movie. We don't talk about him much, and he had a contract with Canon. He did a lot of the American Ninja movies, which I'm sure you've mentioned, and I missed all yeah. that. Um, and he died very young of pan pancreatic cancer, which was really sad. And I think he would still be a working actor today if he hadn't oh, yeah. died young. Yeah. And I probably think he was a better actor than the roles he was given because he he was very natural. He was, had a great role in Delta Force. He had um, quite a good role in, I think, American Ninja. And I think he did about four or five other canon movies. And I've seen him in some other things. Uh, he's a good actor. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I like Delta Force. I put it in my top five canon movies. But obviously in the top three, we have to have Invasion USA. <laughs> yeah. Um, me and Matt watched this the other night. I think we mentioned it on your stream mm -hmm. last yeah. Friday. He he rated it really horribly low and thought the film was utter nonsense. But I was 
we were what it was the sort of it's the sort of movie you can watch and you could talk you can yeah. talk to something because you, there's not a lot of dialogue to follow and one of the things i i pre-warned him was i said there's one actor in this film who's absolutely terrible who did not go on to have a big career i want i want you to tell me who it is and we got about half an hour in and he said it's the female reporter isn't it and i said yeah melissa prophet and 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 I think she probably had a bigger role in the film, but if you watch her very first scene, um, she does something that um, when I get new acting students and they haven't done a lot of work in an acting class, uh, one of one of a tell of an actor being nervous is they'll say a line and they'll slap their body with their hand like that. Oh, you did something wrong. You're terrible. And they do that. And, it, and it's really annoying because as soon as you get that slap in the scene, it distracts from the dialogue that the person's saying. It's 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 a really old um, acting mistake, and um, no one will do that in a no professional actor will ever do that in a scene. Oh, interesting. Absolutely. Watch the very first scene. She does it. She does it twice in her very first line of dialogue. Interesting. Um, and um, yeah, and I, I think um, uh, you know her dialogue is is dire in that movie. Um, she doesn't quite understand the tone of the film, whereas Richard Lynch, who plays the bad guy in Invasion, Richard is Lynch, amazing. Yeah, he's uh, he's just. I mean, how, what else could you? He's just crazy good at everything. I, I love that man. <laughs> yeah, crazy, crazy good. Yeah, um, I, mean, I love I love Richard Lynch, and I wish I could have met him because I really wanted to meet him. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, like, he just he just knew how to milk that the the bad guys like how to yeah. play bad guys and how to like milk like the look at the same time like still like like figure out how to make the those characters like relatable in a way yeah like I, I don't know like there was there was something about his performances that I could think of in, in a few films. Where he's he's the bad guy that you love to hate, you know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he, his his best performance ever by far because he's got great dialogue um, is in Sword and the Sorcerer. Oh yes, yeah. Okay. And you and That's I, both yes. Fans. He yeah. was so good. He was. I've got so the vinyl good. soundtrack down there. I won't get it out. I've got a proper cinema UK cinema quad for that movie as well. Oh wow. Um. Yeah, it's in the shed somewhere. When I when I've got a bigger house, I'll get all these things framed. You know when. When yours and my channels are making millions, of course. No, ah. no, <laughs> um, yes. But, yeah, I, but he is he's he's one of the things that makes Invasion USA great. If they had a weaker actor in that part, it would not have been as good as it was. I like the actor who plays his number two as well. Um, the one who's like Hunter, Hunter, and he pulls the gun out to his side and it, you know, that scene. Um I do think the film's got quite, even with the silliness of the movie, I think the film's got a lot of flaws that, that they could have just done a few small changes and it would have been better. I thought the ending was too rushed. The whole thing of he turns around and kills Rostov, that's it. Now, if there had been a stronger actor in the role of the reporter, I guarantee you there would have been a scene between Hunter and the reporter at the end. Mm -hmm. And there might have been because there there was a lot in that film. Um, I was telling everyone before that um, a lot of that film had been cut out. Yeah, I heard um, that because um, Menachem did had a way of he wanted the pacing to go a certain way, so he would cut out like dialogue scenes that really meant you know were tying things together. Like I, I, I they must have that footage. I mean, it would be so good if they could do. A full, like, if, let's put everything in. I don't care if it's four hours. I think, mean, I mean, if it's really um, that, you know, that much and that that he cut out, I I would love to see the the director's cut. I mean, that yeah. would have been really cool. Hey, it Tim's talk. How you by, doing? It was directed by Hi Tim. It was directed by Joseph Zito, I think. Uh, I believe so. Uh, yes, uh, and I, Cito. And I, I know, I sure is it that. John? Is John Cito or J Joseph? I think it's jo Joseph Cito. Okay. Yeah, Joseph Cito, mm -hmm. and I don't think, unfortunately, I don't think he's he's with us anymore. I think he passed away. Um, well, let's uh, make sure if we're going to say that. 
Um, I yeah, hate saying I, I, that somebody no, passed wrong. away and they they're really still alive. The music um, is is really good for the movie. That's one of the best of the canon scores that I've got. I think Invasion USA, Delta Force, and Invaders from Mars, which are three of my favorite canon films, they all have really solid scores. And the music was I don't even need to it's look at the still alive. <laughs> he is. Well, yeah, uh, it might be. It might be the composer that passed away, Jay Chataway. He may have. He may. Have okay, passed. don't make me look this guy up. My God, stop telling me that people. Die. I'll stop mentioning uh, <laughs> any other potentials. Because I that? normally, when I rewatch a movie, I like to see what people are doing now, and I normally check on everybody. Okay. Um, I think it might have been Jay, that, but the score is great for Invasion USA. <laughs> <laughs> Not a yeah, big I score. Was... I have to just make sure because I don't want to um, pronounce okay. anyone passed away before their time. <laughs> no, 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 we, we, no. Come and come and be on our channel. Um, uh, um, but yeah, I, well, you haven't heard from these guys for a long time. No, so it's hard Jay Chatterway is still alive as well. God, I, there was somebody oh, to do with Invasion USA who had a big role who's who's no longer with. It. I mean, I know that that we lost. Um, uh richard lynch a long time ago uh, mm -hmm. um, yeah. but it was somebody else it was more recent it might have been one of the producers or um, um maybe i i don't know got that wrong well i need to track down jay chataway and <laughs> jay, don't get them on my channel then that's right <laughs> if I, if I get them on for uh, an interview because jay chataway did several tracks for star trek the next generation i believe oh really yeah oh cool so um uh I'll show you this one. I'll, I'll just I'll need to dash to the bathroom again in a second, but let me show you this before I do that. Um, so this is the Firewalker. So. Oh, fire! Oh, ha, we we're we're not there yet. Oh, did you not cover Firewalker? Not yet. Firewalker's definitely before eighty six. Just so you know. Um, I can tell you. Yeah, because uh, I've got the year. We on. Didn't, well, yeah, we didn't cover it yet, but so oh, we'll I, save okay. it. We'll oh, save it. Well, let me save let it. me hold on to that. Can yeah, I dash we'll the bathroom real quick then? Yeah. <laughs> let, let me. I'll be right back. Two yeah. seconds. <laughs> oh, man. Um, yeah, we didn't cover um, that one yet. Let me just make sure, unless I skipped over it. Um, I, might, I might have skipped over it. And so then we can cover it now. Let's see. Yeah, why am I not getting that? Let me just see what year that I, I must have had the year differently. Um, Fire Walker. Oh, okay. it's, it's 1986. Okay, so it, I just haven't, I didn't finish all of 1986 because it would, we would be here for like well, we can, we can leave five it hours. Because there's a, we're doing a third part next week, right? Yes, yes. So well, we can leave it till next week if you want. Okay. Yeah. So hold that one. That's that's probably going to come up next. Um, I, I did have um, a couple of others on your list that you I'm sure you mentioned. I did want to comment on briefly. Yeah. Um, so of the ones on the list that I think you covered tonight, just to say I saw King Solomon's Minds at the cinema. OK. I, I saw Life Force at the cinema. Okay. I saw Runaway Train at the cinema. Okay. I was working at the cinema when Cobra was on, so I saw Cobra countless times. Mm, yeah, Cobra. Um, so I got to see quite a lot of those on the big screen. Um, Bolero, I saw on video. Sort of uh, Valiant, I saw on video. Miss, miss, missing in Action, one, one and two, I saw on video. Missing in Action did get a cinema release, but I didn't go and see it. Um, Exterminator 2 I saw on video. Exterminator 1 was one of the films that was banned as well, along with Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Oh, um, Terminator, uh, Exterminator 2? Yeah, Robert Ginty. Robert, yeah, Robert, Robert, Robert Ginty. Ginty. Yeah. yeah, we did go over that one. Yeah. Oh, so yeah. It was banned, huh? The first one was banned, and everybody at school would sort of, you know, there'd be some guy that had seen a pirate copy. Why is it banned? Oh, this is <laughs> thing with, you know, I don't want to get into it because of your pg rating but mm -hmm. you know seen with various electrical appliances and a dog um and um and everyone was like, oh you know so we have to track this film down and i remember when i tracked the film down and i finally saw it i was like 
oh uh, yeah okay it's kind of horrifying some some of the stuff's horrifying but i didn't see what the big deal was mm, interesting. um there was a movie made right after um off the back of the success of it's not a canon film but i think we should mention it because it warrants a mention um off the back of the success of the exterminator i think it came out around the same time as exterminator 2 with robert ginty and it was called codename the soldier and it was an 18 movie and it was about um a kind of intelligence operative and it had a very very famous scene where ginty launches off on skis he's being chased by these guys on bikes he launches <laughs> down a mountain he launches off on skis he turns round 180 degrees in midair with a mac 10 it's all done in slow motion firing the mac 10 and the guy coming up on the bike after him gets hit and riddled with machine gun fire incredibly well um edited sequence <laughs> wow and they sold the movie from that shot on the trailer alone apparently i should run for president it says here oh no i'm running for president lance should run for prime minister okay <laughs> my walker was an awesome film uh, it was a good film i wouldn't say it was awesome but it, it, it it's it's one of the better ones and they tried really hard to make it different it's nice to see norris do a comedy role as well a little joke for us people might have thought the exterminator was about a retired terminator <laughs> I can't remember the, the year the first Exterminator, Exterminator movie came out, but I want to say it was like 82, 83, something like that. Yeah, and I don't think it it wasn't with uh, Canon because I was looking for no, it. No, no, it wasn't. They picked up the license for it and mm -hmm. kind of saw a merit in. And Ginty, actually, he passed away pretty recently. He yeah. definitely did pass away. Um, yeah. And he was an underrated actor, I thought. Yeah um he kind of there's there's about five or ten guys that all kind of got stuck in b-movie world and that they'd never kind of broke out of it but a lot of them were much better actors than the scripts that they were given and i think i think ginty was one of those and i think his son is also an actor now i believe mm. um yeah king solomon's minds was was they, anybody they, can look that up for us um uh, uh, if if ginty um is still if he passed away and if he um has oh, he definitely he definitely did pass away i remember yeah. reading yeah yeah that was i pretty... thought i thought so too because he they were everybody was doing like little specials on him yeah yeah it was pretty recent it was a few months ago mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. yeah uh, the king solomon's minds kind of should have been good um but they they it just didn't have a great script and the comedy in it kind of fell flat and there was no chemistry either between um no. Uh, yeah and and now we know why um and for many reasons i know that she just did hated being on that set and she hated everything everybody hated her <laughs> so it no, was I, like i did not was, know that yeah it was a lot of um it wasn't really um a great environment for both of them uh but i i thought when i saw it if, when i first saw it i was like oh these guys are just bickering between each other but um it's just, I don't know, uh, it's kind of weird looking at it now, knowing um, the history. But also, um, they did try. But I, I, I guess, you know, with when you're not, uh, when the editing is done in a certain way. So I don't know if there, there was a story there that was more connective and it was just um, removed for pacing or whatever. I don't know. Mm, uh, uh, I mean, it was the post-production visual effects on it were terrible as well the whole sequence with the plane looked like it was shot in the 1960s and i mean that you would have forgiven that if the script was really good and um you know there's a scene where they they, they get trapped in like a big um they're in a, a big cauldron they're being cooked yes. or mm -hmm. and right. it's also <laughs> and it rolls down a hill and that whole scene is really naff <laughs> i mean it, it yeah. shouldn't be but it but it is and then I remember there's a scene where uh, the guy who's in Indiana Jones, who's, who's in the movie, who's also plays Gimli, um, John Reese davis is in it. Yes. Mm -hmm. And they clearly cast him because he was in Raiders of the Lost Ark. Pretty much. Would get Raiders of the Lost? I would get that yeah. guy. And there's a scene where he comes in into a village running and firing a machine gun, which is clearly a shot from a much 
bigger action scene that clearly wasn't able to be filmed. So they staged the last 30 seconds of it in order to save money and just put that in the movie. Um, Because I'm pretty sure if they shot that whole action scene, I'm pretty sure more of it would have been in the the film because the action that was in the film wasn't wasn't very good. Um, And it did it. They made a sequel, which I think came to that. You'd be covering that next week, I think. I believe so. I did. Did I? No, I didn't cover it yet. Yes. I think it came after '86. I think it was. I think it was like three years later. It might have been. Um, Mm -hmm. Mm Hmm. Uh. You know, I thought Life Force was a for all the problems it had was actually a pretty interesting movie, and it, it tried to do something different. And you know, that's always to be commended. So on your list, I think that one I would I would say was not a bad film. Miss, Missing in Action Two was surprisingly good for what it was. That was the one set in the prison camp with the rope bridge, and they were trying to figure out how to escape. So it's very much a, a prisoner of war escape movie okay yeah uh well you know the story behind that right that that was supposed to be the first movie yeah i'm and i'm not but i'm not sure why it wasn't the first movie is there well i they thought at the time that the first movie um which was originally the second movie was better and so they wanted to start off stronger right so then that's why it was switched. Were, were they shot back to back then? Yeah, there was shot like right oh, and, that, and did, shot and work. and produced. Thought they did through, they went through the entire post production uh, too at the same time. So they were able to look at both films and judge them separately. There's a there's a canon movie missing off your list from this era, this era, um, which if you're doing early canon tonight, which you know the eighties. 80 mm-hmm. to 86. I'm just going to try and get the name of it for you quickly and I'll, I'll see if I can grab the poster so we can we can share it. Um, Norris wasn't in it, but his brother or Aaron, I believe, had something to do with this film. And I remember seeing the poster for it when I worked at Canon and thinking, that looks different. And um, it went straight to video on the in the UK. And again, it's prisoners escaping from a very remote location it's that kind of storyline i want to say it was called something like arctic heat or something but it, it, it was mm. a canon film i believe um, but most likely it's on the list because uh but it it's not one that i featured because i um but it's a good movie it's a really good film um oh, and almost no one's seen it oh well tell you know um, that's why i'm trying to get the name of it here but i and it might have been one of those ones that's been like retitled. Oh yeah, because they they had a lot of titles for a lot of retitling going on. Mm-hmm. It wasn't wasn't Deadly Force with Wingshauser, wasn't that one? Um, and it was it was shot in like very remote locations, and it felt very real. And I thought, wow, this is a pretty, you know, this is a pretty gritty movie. This is not kind of typical canon digestible fare. And um, I'm sure. One, somebody to do with it, the Norris family had some involvement in it, but I can't seem to find it. Let me just, I'll try that title and see if um, it comes up under that. Because I, I, Arctic Heat is the title that sticks in my mind. Somebody in chat might, might know this. Um, 1986, Mike Norris. Yeah, here we go. Um, oh, okay. So it was retitled. You're not going to believe who directed it. Now, this is interesting. <laughs> and here's the original poster that I'm thinking of. Can I share this with you? Uh, Let me see if I, I'll put it on the thing and then I think you have to. Um, so this was directed by, so it's good I mentioned it, none other than Rennie Harling, director of Die Hard 2 um went on to do cliffhanger with sylvester stallone cutthroat island which almost killed his career off what year was this This was 1986 and it's called arctic heat oh yeah i didn't finish i didn't finish uh 1986 oh sorry okay but i think you probably would have <laughs> overlooked this movie though okay let's let's put it up there yeah no one remembers it no one saw it 
it it came okay. straight straight to video and it's it's kind of about i think it's like in a russian gulag and it's about some prisoners escaping and somehow an american ends up with them and look i haven't seen it in a really long time but i remember at the time i thought this movie was really good and i was i was surprised at how good it was um but yeah and rennie harlan was the director so there you go that might be part of the reason why actually it stood out above he was a talented man even then um so it now the main title that it has at the moment is um uh, it's called born american so this is another poster for it um born american i've never heard it i've never heard it being called born american before interesting yeah so so i've never seen this this cover i'm guessing this is for some kind of re-release um this was certainly in my video shop with a canon logo on it whether canon had it for a while or um i don't know cinema cinema group presents but i'm pretty sure cinema group was one of the subsidiary companies of canon they had a lot of subsidiary companies as a way of juggling money so not all of their films were released under canon okay moonbeam 87 says he's heard of it yeah um it's a very good film i mean i listen i might look back on it now and really regret that it got the it got harlan the gig for prison that's right yeah and prison is a good movie more. prison is a very good movie is prison um a, a canon film or no no it's not it's got okay. a very young vigo mortison in it mm. and it's a horror film about a guy's a, a dead prisoner's spirit that takes over everything in a prison where a load of prisoners get relocated temporarily and it starts killing them off um so it's a horror movie but it's very well done it's a good movie i saw prison i saw prison at the cinema so uh yeah okay so that is that is arctic heat there's another poster for it um oh it's, oh we don't want to make two that's yeah so there you go that's that's the original poster that, that was on the video shop um but um, i remember this with canon artwork on it oh okay now i might be wrong about that but i'm I'm I when we went through the you remember I told you about the big canon books yeah we had with all the artwork posters I remember the poster for that being in the book and you did have that book was divided into, into sections there was all the stuff that was being released under canon and then in the the rear section of the book there was a load of other things under a load of other small companies and at the time I actually just thought this book was being used by several different companies but i think they were all somehow connected to canon mm. um yeah so yeah there you go all right i'll take that down now okay <laughs> all right uh, right. any more films that you were um that you had um that you wanted to talk about that were earlier on the, on, the only one I, the, I think the only other one I, I comment on a little bit is is cobra um you know very cool looking poster very cool looking oh, costume very yeah. cool looking car the film looks good um but the bad guys in the movie are very strange this kind of cult of guy with axes and stuff and the story is just a bit naff and um <laughs> I, I, was, I thought it was that well they were creepy though Ugh. yeah they were creepy. <laughs> the, the, the film just didn't seem nothing in it kind of seemed to fit it was like characters were existing from different movies the film would tonally was was all over the shop it looked good um stallone looked good in it and then they didn't really play with the toys much you know he kind of had this cool gun but i think that he only used it a couple of times and he had this cool car but he only used it a couple of times so um i think it just they should have sat down you know all of the stuff was stallone for canon was really rushed over yeah. the top was really rushed um cobra was really rushed and did he do did he do one other movie or on my or was it just those two i forget all of the time i think he just did those oh, two and you know that deal was signed on a napkin in can <laughs> where where still uh, uh, golan bro i don't know if you've seen the documentary you'll know the story they demanded a meeting with stallone's agent 
Stallone took the meeting, uh, Stallone's agent, not Stallone, took the meeting and said, my client is not going to work for no B-movie production company. You know, this is Sylvester Stallone. He only does A-list -A films, Hollywood studio films. You can't afford him. And um, uh, well, what's your minimum client's fee, um, Joram Globus said. And they said, well, uh, he won't do a movie for you guys for less than however much money it was. It was a ridiculous sum. It, I don't know if it was 30 million, but it was it was a big figure. Yeah. And he just pulled a napkin off the table and he said, right, I'm, I'm signing this now and I'm going to sign this. This is a contract for him to do, I think it was two or three movies for us, and this is the figure. And the, the agent went, okay then. And the figure was ridiculous. <laughs> it, was like, it was like his normal fee plus 50%. It was huge. Yeah. Yeah. And they just did that sort of thing on a whim without really thinking, well, what projects are we going to give this guy? What are the no, budget they didn't need that. going to be? And, and the, one of the production managers says on one of the documentaries, you know, we should have sat back and spent a bit more time looking at the quality and if mm -hmm. even though invaders from mars wasn't a big hit it's a really good quality production so they had the talent to make great films albert poon was a really talented director and they strangled him with the budgets they yeah. gave him um oh, you know he yeah. did captain america for them i think i don't know if you mentioned that early and he was going to do the spider -Man. no it's that's that's in the 90s right yeah you might be right that might yeah, have come that's... later he was going to yeah. do i remember the posters for the spider-man film in yeah. the office at canon group in the <laughs> 80s those posters were up yeah coming soon you know they couldn't wait to do <laughs> the spider-man movie and mm -hmm. but it just didn't it just didn't happen yeah i think runaway train um i vaguely remember somebody got nominated for an oscar for that one yeah both of them um both eric roberts and uh rebecca de mornay no um she was great in it as well as the train uh, the only woman that's on the train who's part yeah. of the crew yeah um that's a really good film john really... john voight he, john he voight. also was for best actor and eric yeah. for supporting actor and i think i believe it was like sound or something some other some other um um edit i think editing was the and you you look at runaway train and you look at american ninja and it it's like they're made by two completely different production companies because everything about them even though of course in genre terms they're not remotely in the same ballpark but you can look at four films made by a Hollywood production company and they have a certain stamp. They have a certain veneer. They have certain production values. There is a consistency about them. Yeah. The consistency of Canon was all over the shop. You know, you'd have one film that would be here and another film that would be be here. And um, I do think it's it's great that you're you're giving them a shout out because there's some very decent films under their label which almost don't get the credit that they're yeah. due because they've got the Canon label on them, yeah. which is yeah. a shame, I think. Yeah, and and, and I, I, you know, as I do a lot of research on this, you know, I hear a lot of stories, horror stories of, of, of some of the conditions people um, were working under, yeah. uh, the stress, um, and they made some uh, really scandalous choices back then but at the same time uh I, I do believe that a lot of these films even the ones that are you know that you can criticize and say you know that's no, not like you know the best film ever they usually have something to them that that makes them unforgettable you know and um yeah i, I, I mean you know, you can't watch, you can't forget Invasion USA once you see. Yeah, it. no, come on. <laughs> uh, that, it's just like somebody threw some some steroids at the wall, and then they, they, and then they threw more. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, there's... and it's it, it's really um, and and it's supposed to. Be, it, it that was exactly what they were going for. They were going for reaction. They were going for in that that big bombastic entertainment and i i love mm. that like i think i i respect it 
quite a bit. Um, and, um, you know, I, I think for a lot of low budget movie uh, or, or smaller independent film companies, um, I'm, I'm, I'm actually looking forward to diving more into that kind of uh, those kinds of um, groups and seeing what they have, you know, in the way of science fiction. And I, I, um, I think a great stream to do, and if you do it, I'm there 100 percent would be to do the early work of New Line Cinema. New because Line Cinema, yeah. New, oh. They were very much in the same, the industry regarded them very much in the same pond as Canon back then. And there were there were uh, three or four companies. And, of course, you, you've got to do it. I mean, I, I've been planning on, I'm trying to get this guy on my channel. I've been trying to get him. I've written to him about five times. You've got to do a, a, a show about, um, and I'm, I, I might do it and invite you, or you can come and be on that one with me. Um, I've got to do Empire Pictures, which is Charles Band, who did Ghoulies, Robojocks, The Eliminators, or, and the, you know anything that had Charles Band's name on it. The Trancers films with my favourite B movie actor of all time, Tim Thomason, and God, what, what I would give to interview him. Um, Charles Band like put out an, an incredible amount of. Um, very low budget science fiction and horror films and a couple of fantasy movies um, as well. Um, and, and the story behind Empire Pictures is absolutely fascinating and that they, you know, they, they bought a castle in, in Italy and had their production office in it. And the plan was to use the castle as a set in movies. And then that all didn't quite work. And, <laughs> you, you know, lots of really brazen ideas that never paid off. But they did build a studio in Italy, which is now a theme park. I've been there, um, you know, and I met people that were working there for Empire Pictures uh, when that happened. And I got to hear all the the stories. And um, so there are canons canon was the biggest one but there were a, there were several smaller companies mm -hmm. that were responsible for all those other little quirky films that you got on the video shows between kind of 82 and i guess 92 would be the the, the big decade yeah yeah i i think so because then started things started to really fade out about 93 yeah. right 93. mid 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 90s those kind yeah. of companies kind of a lot of them burned out or they yeah. Or they gravitated like New Line Pictures, of course, slowly crept up and, and, and you know, they became all about big cinema releases and then, of course, did Lord of the Rings and good on them. Um, so, and then, unfortunately, there were, you know, Empire went under. Um, I've got a baseball cap for Charles Band's company over there, which is Dark Moon Pictures, it's, it's called now. And I don't think he has all the rights to all of his films, but the ones that he does have the rights to, they're all being re-released through Dark Moon Pictures, and you can get various kind of Blu-ray special sets of Ghoulies 1 through 4 or Trancers 1 through 6 and, you know, um, various other uh, films like that. But, mm. yeah, that would be uh, – I'll do, I'll do an Empire Pictures one. You, you do a New Line one and we'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll reconvene. Yeah, Trancers – first trances movie is is good and of course the the actress in that you know went on to have a fantastic career um and and went on to do really really big movies i think she was nominated for either nominated for an oscar or or won uh an oscar i'm sorry i, I, I again i can picture her but her name has gone straight out of my head um uh, helen hunt oh yeah and that was in 1984, Trances. Mm. Um, Full Moon is still going. Yeah, uh, Gary, I got my hat from them literally a couple of months ago. They are, Charles Band is there. I found him on Facebook. I found his, I've got an email for Charles Band. I have emailed him so many times. And um, <laughs> you know, I don't know what else I can do to try and get him to come on the stream and promote his films and ho ho hope that I introduce more people to his films. Um, and, and Tim Thomason was like their go-to actor. He was in Dole Man, another one. I, I think he might have been in Zone Troopers, um, which is another. That's a very weird sci-fi. What's his name again? Tim Thomason. Oh. Do, I, you, you, I, I, I can get his picture up right now because I've got his IMDb on right this second. Now, look, he was in a, a Uncommon Valor, which is another um, favourite movie of mine um, with with. Gene Hackman, 
Um, Tim Thomason is still around. Um, I bumped into his double um, in Cannes um, a few years ago, and I thought it was him. And he actually, this guy actually said to me, "Yeah, you know what? People come up to me and say that all the time. Say uh, you must, you're Tim Thomason, right?" So he's also got a double who is not him, <laughs> apparently. Um, oh. But yeah, he, he's a. He's I know a who you're talking about. He's really cool. I like him. Um, yeah, he just stopped doing um, um, stuff, right? He just quit he's working. Re he's retired now. I saw him doing um a crowdfunding campaign um but he or, or assisting somehow uh with some sort of crowdfunding campaign um, um uh, i yeah i mean but he's i you know from what i can tell he's still compass mentors he was in a great film that no one ever talks about which i'm going to do a retro review of called volunteers with john candy and 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 um tom hanks about the building of the bridge with the peace corps in and it, i think it takes place in vietnam and they're all building this bridge and this local warlord wants in on it and um and tim thomason plays this crazy ex vietnam vet and he's having he's having the time of his life playing this kind of ca camped up bad guy um who keeps coming on to tom hanks's girlfriend uh, um and yeah it's it's a that's a good movie i really like volunteers I think oh that really came, that was yeah, that I, I, I'm trying to think of what movie I've seen him in, and it, I, I'm like drawing a blank. And then I just typed his name, and of course, it like he's been in a, yeah. I mean, he's been page in. doesn't really come up for, for very. Does he? Is he coming up for? I've uh, got oh, it. One, I've got one, it. Oh, he was in Nemesis Three. That's why I, I probably know him. Yeah, he uh, worked no, without him. He worked with Albert Poon about three or four times. Um, okay. and Albert Poon couldn't say enough nice things about him. And when I yeah. told Albert I wanted to interview him, he was, oh, I'll try and sort that out for you. But Albert had brain, yeah. brain cancer he, at the time. So, you know, we. He was in the in the original Nemesis. Yeah. I I loved him in that movie. It was yeah, so he's, good. He's, he's, he's very naturally funny as well. He's got a great timing uh mm -hmm. for, for humor um yeah and um yeah i i just uh you know i wish i could interview. and he had a great look yeah there's doll man um which i never saw and he was in a sci-fi quirky movie in the 70s called quark i don't know if you ever saw that no oh he was in cherry 2000 okay yeah yes, got, that's it, got, a, it, got, that's it, got it got it got it got it got it yeah it's in there now yes i got it okay so doll man um is one i've always wanted to see because he's the size of a doll right that's right yeah okay that's the that's the movie i've been looking for yeah. for years i've been looking for this movie okay you can get that from dark moon pictures let me see you guys let me get my hat because it's right behind me um that company. Wow, I've been looking for this movie uh, for so great. long. Uh, Charles Band's company is Full Moon. Full Moon Pictures. There you go. Full Moon Pictures. That's who you can get Dollman from. I believe they are selling it via their their website. I think. Okay. Um. Yeah. And um, uh, Moonbeam says, I know who Tim Thomas is. Uh, yeah, Moonbeam. I mean, if listen, if you watch films in the 80s, you saw him in more than one movie. And uh, I thought he was heading to the for the um, A list, actually, because he was um, Uncommon Valor was actually the first Vietnam POW movie. That's right. Most people forgot about it. Oh, just for people, anyone who's listening can't read this. Uh, Gary says, Uncameron Valor was actually the first Vietnam POW rescue film. Um, do you know which year that was, um, Gary? Uncommon, Uncommon Valor came out in 1982. 1982, wow. Yeah. Um, you guys are so, you guys remember all the, um, I try. <laughs> Thomason played a helicopter pilot in, the, he was one of the rescue team. Um, and he's great in it. He's great in Uncommon Valor. He plays a character called Chart, so I can even remember his character. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. I've got yeah, the I've got the um, soundtrack to uh, Uncommon Valor. I think it was James Horner. 
Okay. I think, I think it was James Wan. I've got, I've got a. I've Ooh, got a, that's really a, good. Yeah. Uh, Brogu says that he remembers um, I, uh, Tim Tom Thomerson was in the first Nemesis. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, I love that first Nemesis movie. That I don't know what it was about that movie, but I absolutely adored it. Well, and it was the other one. Very quirky, quirky sci-fi, which I, I think. Yeah, you that's know, the kind I like. <laughs> that's the kind of like the most uh and then uh the other nemesis uh movies were just out of control uh but yeah i kind of like, they I kinda like that too <laughs> i kind of like that too <laughs> they weren't great um you know there was some there was some good ideas in some of them but uh again yeah. you know you're talking about the budgets for those by the yep. way yeah i think some of them were shot for under two hundred thousand dollars yeah, it looked like yeah, you can tell. You can tell. Yeah, so um, you know, he did not have a lot of cash to play around with on those films. Yeah, Brogu says I love the first Nemesis movie as well. I even got it on laser disc. Laser wow, disc. That... I remember laser discs. Wow. Yeah. They were like they like they were the size of vinyl records. Oh my goodness. Do you have a laser disc player still? Oh my goodness. I'm, yeah, I'm I, just I, catching up to like Blu-ray, and uh, like maybe I need to get a machine or something. I don't. I don't oh, retro! I I picked up a Blu-ray pack. You know, Matt bought like 25 Blu-rays during his stay. He's just gone oh, to really? the wedding. He's going to. But I picked up a Blu-ray pack that you're gonna love. Um, just the other day, check this out. This is a Blu-ray pack of all three airport movies. Oh wow! Yeah, I had to have that. <laughs> so very vintagey, but um, I'm kind of keen to watch them all in succession. So we've got, Con I think you got Concord Air. Oh, there's four of them actually. What? There's I didn't four. even know that. Yeah. Oh, hold on, hold it still for a little bit longer because I'm gonna um, blow you up there. You got the original Airport, Airport 75, Airport what? 77. And then there's the one Airport 80, which is the one with the Concord in it. I remember that. Yeah. Incredible. 77 is the one where it, it, it sinks and it's under the water with the hijackers. 75, there's a mid-air collision. And the first one is more based on the book, and it's like an ensemble film of all the different characters in the airport, very similar to the TV show Hotel, which was, of course, written by the same author. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah. So that was... Uh, that was pretty. That was pretty good to get that. I've yeah, and of course, I think I've shown this before, but I've got the I've got the Nemesis uh, set right here. So, oh, okay, the complete box set. Yeah, that's <laughs> the, the the contains all the other films that you really don't want to watch. But um, is it does it really contain all of them? It does. It's got all of them. It's got because uh, there's yeah, there's four there's four movies in the series, mm -hmm. and this contains all four movies. Huh. And I don't think I've actually watched all of the fourth one. Watched some of it. And I was like, yeah, I think I need to do something more important right now. It, it got really it got really <laughs> wild by the end. Yeah. Uh, I did watch them all. And, uh, yeah, they, it got really, really weird at the end. Maybe, like, even, yeah, just I can't even explain what it is without making a um, – yeah, I, I don't even know what to say. <laughs> I, picked up, um, I picked up this as well, which is one of my more recent sci-fis that I've enjoyed. Life, yeah. Uh, I thought it was a good movie. Um, okay. Inside Man, who's been on my channel, I think you've been on at the same time as him. He never comes on camera. He works in the in industry. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. He's got some very interesting on-set stories about this film, which he had to tell me about off camera. Oh. Uh, yeah. Um, it was a, it was a, it was a difficult shoot. It was a difficult shoot for people. Oh, I can imagine. Yeah. Because um, somebody caused a lot of problems for everybody else. That's all I'm oh, going to say. I can only imagine who. Yeah. <laughs> um, the um, okay. So Moonbeam said, uh, "Laser disc was uh, the eighties. Uh, my dad worked at a video store and rented laser disc, and maybe that's why I'm the reviewer I am today." Yeah, we're kind of an extension of our parents. I know for for a fact, you know, my mom loved the movies. So, um, yeah, if you I, had a laser disc player um, back then, 
you were considered to be like it was it was a bit niche and, and it was a, it was a it was a collector's market mm -hmm. there was a oh, whole absolutely. load of films that were released on laser disc that were not available for video rental initially because the video market didn't explode overnight it took a bit of a while to get going especially of yeah. course the retail side yeah they, they were really and, expensive well you know the film that that began the the retail side there were two movies that began the retail side for vhs do you know which 80s films they were no pop quiz retro okay so it was raiders of the lost ark and footloose were the oh. two big movies that they said let's put these on the shelf for 9.99 and they were tests like, like these are very popular films if we can sell this many units and we think we can let's see how many and they did i think raiders was first and i think then footloose oh, and wow. then they suddenly realized people want to buy these films we should do this more yeah isn't that true now they don't like $200 they, don't, from them. they don't like releasing the movies now yeah they don't no. but that it's you know believe it or not um that's that's really where you're going to get a lot more of your your profit they they don't they don't understand i think they thought that streaming was going to save them but um the model hasn't it needs some uh, it has some quirks in them I, I don't like watching if it's a film i really want to see i'm either going to watch it at the cinema or i'm going to buy it because you know i think i mentioned this on your channel the other week i rewatched heat um, which is a film I can just put on and have on, on in the background and I'll notice things I haven't noticed before. And I put it on and the things that I noticed were that they'd cut it. Oh, and gosh. and I, I was very, very, I was very angry. I was like, how dare you censor this, this, you know, how dare you presume. They're doing that to all the movies. Censor my view, viewing. Yeah. Um, how many other films are you doing this to, you know? So that really. All of them. <laughs> all of them. My mum was a horror fiend. Uh, this is from Straw Dog 78. Uh, it says, uh, my earliest memories were watching the movies I had no business watching. <laughs> All of us. <laughs> and, um, and Straw Dogs was one of the movies that was banned on that video nasty list. So oh, really? Straw Dogs has named themselves intentionally. And I think 78 was probably the year Straw Dogs was released with Dustin Hoffman. Oh. About a group of people that get trapped in a farmhouse with a load of psychopaths, and it's it's Susan George plays his wife, and it's a pretty gritty, dark, horrible film. And I don't mm. I don't actually like watching it even now. It's not mm. a pleasant movie to watch. Yeah. And as this is a PG stream, we should probably, probably leave that there. Probably why uh, I haven't watched it. Well, no, I mean this is great. Then we know what to avoid because I'm not going to watch that one. <laughs> Uh, the brother says, "Yes, physical media is the way to go. Too many negatives to streaming movies. Uh, movie Agreed. is today and uh, gone tomorrow. Yeah, I, there's I can't trust it anymore. Um, I, I, I was I was uh, I was uh, drinking the Kool Aid before, but now I'm like, uh, it's not uh, sustainable. So." Mm. Uh, Moonbeam87 uh, says, I saw Raiders of the Lock Lost Ark when I was seven. I remember the first time I saw it. I was chomping a carrot and then uh, got to the end of the carrot and lost my baby teeth. Oh, it's so cute. <laughs> Was that like because you were you were chattering so much you were scared and, and <laughs> by the time the ark exploded and people's heads were blowing up, you your teeth were all in your tummy. <laughs> no, but yeah, the the uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark is one of those amazing films. I mean, you can watch it today, and it's just like I'm always gripped by you know that that um, chase scene with the um, with the horse in the in the van. It's just like that that moment is just so incredible. There's so many moments, so many moments in that movie. I, I, I watched it again, um, having seen. Uh, dial of doo-doo and um I, I i had to watch it again just to check it was still as good as i remembered it you know and 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 it was still as good as i remembered it was better than i remembered it actually. yes yes it gets um, better every time yeah and i just was like man how did they go so wrong and yeah you know, didn't didn't like somebody sit down with all the writers and 
creatives yeah. who were, had any input on the film whatsoever and said, this is what works. So we kind of need more of this, but with an original story. <laughs> You're doing more thinking than a lot of people. Um, well, but... clearly. Yeah, that, that's um, why that's why I should be prime minister. Apparently, according to yes, one of the prime your, minister, uh, uh, Brogu says uh, you were drinking the Kool Aid when uh, when you have your own stash, you can get high on your own supply. Well, that's uh, the plan. That is the plan. Al Pacino that's says plan. never to do that. Ah, don't get high on your own supply. Yeah, that's. A... <laughs> or was that Michelle Pfeiffer? Gar actually, may have may have said that line. Scarface. It sounds like one yep. one of his lines. Um, all right. Well, I think this is um, we. have We've made some incredible ground. We um, we hit um, 1986. We still have a lot more uh, to go for 1986, 1987, all the way to uh, 1994. I believe that was when they did their last, you know, they kind of broke up at that point and it, it became something else. And then they, uh, the, the two cousins went off and did their own movies. And it was, it's kind of interesting, the story, the aftermath was kind of interesting. So we're going to talk about the aftermath of this whole thing as well. We're going to, so, we're going to get into that next week, right? Yes, next week. Yeah. And uh, hopefully we can, uh, will you be able to make that one uh, as well? I think I, I think I can. And I, hopefully I'll be on a bit earlier. Okay. Um, um, if so, I can, I'll, if I can, I'll be on it from the beginning. Um That'll be awesome if you can. Um, and that's awesome. So uh, we I hope to see everyone else, uh, everyone in the chat to be able to um, join us for that as well. Um, it should be a lot of fun. I'm like really um, so like excited to be able to share um, this time with you guys, to be able to talk about the studio. And the way we've been talking about it has been really inspiring. And yeah. I hope more channels get to do stuff like this where we can dive deep into some of the smaller networks, the st smaller studios and kind of give them some roses and, and make, you know, <laughs> and cherish some of the mo moments that we had enjoying their content. So, yes. Thank you so much, Lance, for uh, everything. Uh, oh, my pleasure. I love doing these. And uh, showing us your your goodies, your memorabilia, and all that stuff that is really cool. Um, because oh, I I bought one new thing oh, when okay. I went to Brighton with Matt. Do you want to see it? It's sure, very, why not? Very nerdy. <laughs> Let me show you oh, we... you right up here. Let's give that a shot. I bought a Captain Scarlet SPV. Oh wow! from Jerry Anderson's Captain Scarlet. I think this is one of the 21st century ones. So they're out. You can't get them anymore. And this oh, was wow. on a market stall. It's not boxed. The figure's missing. So I got it for £12. But I thought that's a pretty okay. good deal for the vehicle. So oh, I, want, I want it. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you might. <laughs> I've never seen right Captain Scarlet. So, um... It's a good show. It's, 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 it's fun. It's much more serious than Thunderbirds. But it's, oh, really? Uh, yeah. I do yeah, love it's that. a fun show. Looks like a cool vehicle. I love the design. Um, well, I may well do. I'm going to do a big Jerry Anderson stream at some point. I might do a Cap Captain Scarlet one. So you should come on that. And, and one of the reasons you'll like Captain Scarlet is because the angels who fly the combat aircraft, they're all female pilots. Oh. And they look like you. So, <laughs> so I think you'll, you'll really dig it because you'll well, be looking at one cool. of the angels and you'll be going, look, there's me flying one of the planes. Uh. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah, so there you go. It's a, No, it's and a good show. It's a lot of fun. Moonbeam wants to correct um, a, a little detail. He lost um, the two at the beginning of the film. Ah, during the boulder rolling sequence. Probably, perhaps. yeah. That that always does in everybody. And <laughs> Brogu says, uh, this was a great show, but all of your shows are great. Oh, you're so sweet. I'm going to add that to the closing uh, as well. So, everybody, we're, we're closing up shop here. I'm going to play a, um, a three-minute. Packing them away. Okay. <laughs> um, we're going to play a three-minute video. That is um, going to be enough time for you to um, leave some last comments or messages to the friends that you have in the chat.
any friends that you made and any messages you have for me. Uh, just want to let you guys know that uh, I will be uh, streaming tomorrow for the watch party. Uh, it's going to be, ooh, which one is it going to be? What's your watch party tomorrow? What are you watching? Baseballs, 1987. Oh, that's right. Yeah, I saw the, <laughs> I saw the advert for that. Yeah, I, saw, I yeah. saw that at the cinema. That's a fun, that's a fun movie. Yeah, that is going to be so much fun and just going to be a barrel of laughs and I can't wait. Um, and we, we could always use a good laugh around here. And um, yeah, I'm going to play the video now. So uh, without further ado, everybody, uh, I bid you adieu and take care of yourselves. See you in the next video or live stream. See you soon. Retro Nerd Girl, you are clear for takeoff.